This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Great. So, um, being a presence of a quorum, I'm going to call to order this meeting of the Regional School Committee at 6.32 p.m. on Tuesday, November 17th. And we'll start with a roll call attendance. Um, when I call your name, please state that you're present. Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Seeger. Seeger present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Ms. Stancer. Stancer present. And McDonald present. And now I'll call to order the meeting of the Amherst School Committee at 6.33 p.m. And we'll also do roll call attendance. Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. And McDonald present. And uh, for those uh, watching at home, we do have um, competing uh, events this evening. Um, and so some of our other attendees will be joining us uh, momentarily. Um, our first order of business is to approve our minutes from uh, November. Um, the agenda states November 4th and 10th, but I believe we have just November 10th in our packet. So tonight we'll just approve November 10th. Um, I had one um, correction on item number two. Um, it should read Ms. McDonald called the Amherst School Committee to order, not region. Ms. Dancer? You're muted. Under the superintendent's update, there was another item. Um, Dr. Morris reported on the staff, let's see, the curriculum day survey. survey. And um, there were 180 responses with an average of 4.5 out of 5. Are there any other? Mr. Harrington and then Ms. Seeger. Yeah, so uh, section 8 under subsection D. There, there are a couple things here. Um, so says, uh, Mr. Hankin describes that there's a meeting posted on the website that describes metrics. We just leave it that there was a, there was a meeting posted on the website. And then the, uh, let's see, and then there's the part, uh, Dr. Morris clarified that the MOA states that the district and JLNSC defines a quorum and states that the subcommittee cannot have dialogue. That should just be myself and Mr. Sullivan are a constitute a quorum and I think that's yeah that's that's all I had there Miss Seeger I believe I actually attended this meeting though I arrived late yes <laughs> I had another correction on um also on item eight but um on item a under section eight um, it, it says so far we have a moratorium on NCAPs and we're focusing on doing more. I think we were talking about we are looking at advocacy on that, but I'm going to look to my colleagues to see if they have a better. I don't believe that that's what we talked about it because we were talking about advocacy for budget funding. Yeah, that's right. We definitely would not have said we already have a moratorium on MCAS because we don't. Mm. And I think it wouldn't be under the budget section either, if, even if we had mentioned it, I don't think. I, I, I think if I recall, it was probably a comment talking about advocacy in general and what yeah. things are currently in the works and what things already have some momentum. And I, th I think I may have mentioned that um, that Senator Comerford and the MTA and some other groups are were in the MCAT and uh, MASC had some initiatives for MCAS moratorium. Um, so 
I mean, it's per perhaps it would be accurate to say so far there's consideration for a moratorium on MCAS. And yeah, we're focusing on doing more. That sounds good. That sounds correct. Any other edits? Seeing none, um, I will move that the region um, approve the <laughs> approve the minutes from November tenth with as amended. Is there a second? Lord, second. Moved by McDonald, second by Lord. Uh, we'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demley. Demley, aye. Mr. Harrington. Thank you, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Sorry. It's okay. Ms. Spitzer. Ms. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. And McDonald, aye. Uh, the motion passes unanimously. I'll also move that uh, the Amherst School Committee approve the minutes as amended. We'll take a roll call. Uh, is there a second? Second. Uh, moved by McDonald, seconded by Spitzer. Um, Mr. Demley? Demley, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously. Now um, we'll go to our next order of business is public comment. Um, we have um, a document as well as a one um, voice recording. So I'll play the voice recording as I pull up the document. Hi, my name is Brian Meon, uh, South Hadley. My son plays uh, for varsity hockey. I just think that it's extremely important for these kids to want to play winter sports to be able to participate and have a season. It's tough enough as it is being without having anyways. It's 100% remote learning and they're away from their peers. And it's uh, not having sports will even do more harm, I feel. They do need to be out there and interact in some sort, some way with their peers. And at least playing a sport allows them to get out there. Uh, missing school is bad enough and to take sports away from them, I think it would be an extremely bad idea for these kids. I think they take the proper precautions, be safe, be smart, the mass distancing as much as possible. I think that uh, the season could go on and uh, all everyone involved will have an enjoyable winter sports season. I really hope that they are uh, able to do this and work out and give these kids some sort of resemblance to their, their uh, normal lifestyle there. But I hope that it goes through. Thank you, and uh, we'll see what happens. Bye. Are folks able to see this
My uh, computer seems to have frozen up. I don't know if I'm frozen, but um, I'm not able to scroll right now. Um, I could probably see if I can bring these up for you, Allison. Yeah, uh, that'd be helpful. Yeah, that might be. I'm still getting a spinning wheel. <laughs> Oh, I'm scrolling now. Would you like me to go back? Either way, if you, I mean, as okay. long as you have it up, then um, if you have another trouble, I'll, I'll be ready. Okay. <laughs> it's odd because the uh, document's on my, right on my hard drive. It's not on anything.
so for uh, folks uh, watching at home, that um, this document, um, the complete document, is posted on the website already um, on the agendas page of the Regional School Committee um, on arts.org. So our next order of business is um, the superintendent's update. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Morris. Sure, thank you. Um, so I wanna start with a sort of odd one, but just uh, I saw in the newspaper, I think it's worth noting that um, someone named Pat Shearer, who I don't know, is stepping down on the Pioneer School Committee for the first time. She's been on for 44 years. And so it's not our district, but we're at a school committee meeting and you all know uh, better than me and anyone else what it's like to be a school committee member. And I just, I saw 44 and I said, that person deserves acknowledgement even outside her district, because that's, that's quite an accomplishment. So, um, yeah, just wanted to note that I'll get back to the Amher stuff, but I just uh, I couldn't get over the 44 um, and that number. So maybe one of you will be on 43 years from now. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> uh, it's quite a standard to set. But um, uh, related to this, uh, our district, um, quite a few things to go over. I know we met last week, but um, uh, today, started. Uh, Ms. Cunningham and I are doing some professional development with our AMSAN partners, our Minority Student Achievement Network partners. Um, it was outstanding. Um, so it's called the Reckoning Seminar Series. It's by, being facilitated by Dr. Darnisa Amante Jackson, who is the president and co-founder of the Disruptive Ed Equity Education Project. And it's really supporting district leaders as they, uh, I'll read it because I think it's her words, as they create and strengthen strategic district level roadmaps to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging based initiatives. You know, uh, probably at another meeting, maybe Ms. Cunningham and I will will do more than just the byline and, and talk about some of the work you know we're learning about and how it's you know, involving uh, the work in the district. But you know, really thinking about what would how do district leaders, um, frankly, how do they lead? Uh, how do they um, start having un uncomfortable conversations uh, beyond just the diversity piece, but really to the inclusion and belonging piece uh, for all students, for all staff? And uh, she's an outstanding presenter. You know, it was. Three hours today on Zoom with no breaks, which sounds horrible, and you know everyone was riveted, myself included. Um, so there's four sessions of that, um, but I think over time, you know, Ms. Cunningham and I can bring back some of the things. <clears throat> excuse me, we're working on, um, and so just wanted to share that started today. Um, good news: so, uh, all of you have uh, virtually met Obed multiple times. He's our wonderful. Uh, he's only got two weeks with us left as semester ends, but um, at the Amherst College uh, intern. And it's been such a really symbiotic relationship between um, district staff and OBED that we are working. I think I mentioned this, but this is getting more formalized that we'll, we'll be starting a summer internship project with Amherst College um, so that more of their students who are interested in education, education studies, will be able to um, get an experience with the district. And, um, and it's great because they just actually last week, two, week, two weeks ago, I guess, um, had an education studies major approved. So that's a, a big shift. Um, in an institution that um, doesn't add majors um, frequently, um, that this is many years of, of work of the faculty and staff to establish that interdisciplinary major. So really happy to be partnering with our local, one of our local higher education institutions. And, and again, if there's more OBEDs in the world, we're happy, we're, our doors will stay open. Um, he's been a wonderful resource for us, um, but we appreciate Amherst College students and staff to, uh, who are working on, uh, working, happy to work with us. Uh, last night, we had a great session with uh, Courtney and Sarah from the Bright program, um, not our, our program, but at the Bright, um, the larger clinic. Uh, they uh, provided um, an interactive session around the stress that's coming as winter is coming soon. And they uh, gave examples. It was a lot of question and answers. So they did about 10 or 15 minute spiel. Uh, but the rest of it was all interactive with folks in their community. We got some nice feedback both last night as well as this morning. Uh, the YouTube link we'll put in the newsletter because it stays live. You know, it was recorded and we know some people, you know, last night we took some feedback and did it in the evening because uh, we got some some feedback that the daytime ones were harder for families. Actually, our attendance was lower in the evening, so we may have to rethink that. Uh, there's no good time necessarily for everyone, um, but a lot of people we got feedback, watched it um, this morning and shared how useful it was. I. I Frankly, as a parent, as an educator, I found their work really inspirational and useful as well. So we'll, we'll make sure that gets shared out with everybody. Um, but Obed actually and, and Faye Brady were, were helpful in working on getting that organized as Sasha Figueroa and Debbie Westmoreland were as well. Um, 
So uh, we have surveyed families who have left the district um, in the last year. Um, we'll, we'll, we're still hoping to get more responses. We have about 70, a little shade less than 70 responses, uh, which um, is about a third uh, of the overall responses, a little bit more. And uh, so far in the responses, uh, kind of three even categories, about a third of those families left the area. They moved for jobs or family, whatever reason. A third of the families left uh, for a different um, school because they were planning to do that anyway. And about a third of them left because they really were concerned about the lack of in-person or the questions about in-person learning um, and, and finding another place to do that. Um, some really good feedback on that um, in terms of whether students plan to come back, particularly not so much the families who moved, but the families who've made other choices and still living in the area. Um, it's pretty even split 50-50. Uh, when that data set becomes mature, like we get all we'll do a reminder, uh, we'll be happy to share that with the committee and the and the community. But it really good, some good information, some good data in there. Um, but I just want to let people know that, you know, out of the people who left, it's about 50-50 people who are, you know, sort of planning or likely to come back or people who are unlikely or, or not planning to come back um, more soon. But I just, I know that was a topic that we talked about here. There's a lot of interest in, so I wanted to give the interim update on that. Uh, tomorrow morning, the bright and early, uh, Mr. Harrington and I will be there at 7.30 uh, for the next meeting of the um, building committee. And that meeting will be the election of chair and vice chair of that building committee. We'll do some broad updates on the maintenance plan that was submitted uh, by the district, uh, where we are with the enrollment uh, requests that we've made and waiting for the MSBA to get back to us. Um, so not as much to share. Um, I don't know if it'll be a barn burner tomorrow, Mr. Harrington, it may be a pretty low key early morning meeting, uh, but I think things will start picking up once we get the enrollment uh, report and um, or excuse me, the enrollment letter back from MSBA, that'll sort of set the next, the wheels in motion um, at probably a quicker pace. Anything I'm missing on that one, Mr. Harrington? Nope, perfect. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, you know, uh, my last one, ooh, I've got two more, excuse me. Uh, also an MSAN one is that tomorrow, uh, MSAN knowing that all uh, that many districts, excuse me, not all, but many districts are in virtual, uh, they started a year long virtual learning opportunity for our district's, district's youth equity leaders. Um, there's no conference this year like there typically is. Uh, one of the nice things is they're, they're making separate groups for middle school and high school students. Um, so our faculty and staff uh, and leadership at the building level as well as Dr. Guevara are working on that and the meetings start tomorrow and they're called the MSAN Intersectional Social Justice Collaborative for middle, school, middle and high school students. So really uh, in this time where, you know, the conference, which is always the highlight of the MSAN year for the students isn't possible, it's really nice that they found their MSAN is finding ways for students to connect, um, you know, be it in a virtual context, but uh, much better than uh, not connecting at all. The last one, um, which I'm going to go back in my email and make sure I read correctly, we applied uh, last month uh, for something the state um, DESE is involved with, which is called phase one of the Abbott Fix Now K-12 testing program. And essentially, uh, and I'll share more on this, you know, uh, by email, I can follow up in the meeting. There's uh, quite a few documents, but it, it is not uh, intended to be asymptomatic testing, um, but it does provide free testing for anyone who's in school uh, who has any symptoms of COVID um, and they list what symptoms are there. Um, it is a rapid antigen test, so if there is um, concerns about it, you know, they, they encourage people to follow up with a um, PCR test. But this is really good news. We'll have this active um, as students, you know, hopefully re-enter the school building. And um, we're fortunate many, many districts applied, and thanks to Dr. Brady and others for putting in the application that got us in the first round of, um, of their testing protocol. We did put in a particular language about um, our intensive needs population who may not be able to communicate their, uh, how they're feeling uh, in accurate ways and whether we could use that a little more flexibly with a population that may not be able to um, tell adults or their peers how they're feeling, that if there are some symptoms uh, that are noticed. And so we have some follow-up work with DESE uh, to talk through that, I think, later this week, that at the beginning of next week, um, um, just about, but our application was really centered around uh, not just the typical use, but looking at our intensive needs populations and how we might um, best service them given the sometimes limitations in communication that, that some of our students have. So really good news. Thanks again, Dr. Brady and others who worked on that. And um, 
I think that is my update for this evening. Great. Any uh, comments or questions from the committee for the superintendent? Ms. Spitzer? Sorry, so can I just follow up um, to clarify about the testing program? What's the, um, so this is great news, so thank you for everybody who applied. Um, it's for exclusively for students or is it, would it also cover staff and, and, and teachers in the buildings as well? Yeah, it would be, it's for students and staff, yes. Okay, Sorry. Wonderful. That's okay, yeah. and I, it, it was my fault, it's been a long day. Um, and then um, what's the, <laughs> how how much i guess like what's the capacity like how how quickly i mean i guess it would always depend on community transition but i'm just curious like do we expect this to last for the entire whenever we get kids in schools will it last for an entire um school year or is it something where we might um need to reapply i'm just curious about that yeah so um on the first one um it's, it's a rapid test, so it, it'll come back pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to look at their information. This all came in like today. So um, I'm really just getting caught up. And of course, there's um, pl a plethora of documents uh, for that. Um, but, you know, I think given our current status, I don't, I don't believe that we'll have um, so many students in or so many staff in uh, anytime soon um, that I think we're worried about supply. Um, and I think for them, uh, you know, because it's not being used as a broad um, asymptomatic test, um, the, the sense I got from the language is they're not so worried about supply uh, at this point. Um, if, if it was, you know, everybody being tested three times a week or every day or something, I think that would be uh, a different scenario. But I'm happy after the meeting to send all the information, including FAQs and, and all that to the full committee. Uh, maybe it came in yesterday, but, um, you know, much like Ms. Spitzer, it's been a busy day, not in a bad way, good way. But, um, um, but yeah, no, this is, it's good news and, and we're, we're excited to be chosen and we're excited because I think the state was interested because it was a little bit different take on the standard application when we're talking about um, students. Um, you know, I think I, I, my mistake, I should have said staff and students, but I was talking specifically our application talked about students who may not be able to communicate how they're feeling and being able to use it more often with students um, who may not be able to share some of the symptoms orally. Any other comments? I'm not seeing any right now. Okay, okay. Uh, so we'll move on to the next item, which is um, chair's update. Um, and what I was, I was going to talk about, but I think we can we can circle back to it when we get to our future agenda planning was just a clarification on some questions that have arisen since the meeting on Friday of the JLMSC. We, we talked about it just now in our in our agenda, uh, minutes uh, review, but just to clarify that some of, and remind folks of the conversation that we had last week, the JLM's SC is not a subcommittee of the Regional School Committee. Um, the, as Mr. Harrington noted in his edits to the, to the minutes, um, Mr. Harrington and Mr. Sullivan do form a subcommittee. And so they, they are obliged um, by open meeting law to post their meetings and make them public. Um, and that's also sort of applies to quorum. Um, so I, I think that point of clarification is, um, is maybe helpful for folks to understand um, the, the meeting that, that, um, that we had last week. Um, and I th when we get to future agenda planning, um, we can talk again about that. Are there any questions, comments? Mr. Demley? Yeah, just a somewhat related note. Um, so on, on November 2nd, we, we sent a second request to the APEA executive board asking them if they would talk to us about changing the MOA. Have we, so that was 15 days ago now. Have, have we had a response to that request yet? I have not received any response. Thank you. And uh, welcome, Ms. Kenny. Um, and, and I also, uh, just, as I noted, uh, there's some conflicting meetings that Mr. Sullivan will also be joining later after the Shootsbury School Committee concludes. Um, so we'll move on to next item, which is school committee announcements. Uh, does anybody have announcements? Mr. Harrington. Yeah, I'll just 
jump off of uh, kind of what you were saying. You took away one of my bullet points, but so yeah, I, I just kind of wanted to let everyone know that that I I met last Thursday the twelfth with uh, the APEA representation to the JLMSC, and we kind of uh, talked about some of their concerns. And so I, I just kind of wanted to bring those back to us here at the school committee. And and so one of the one of the concerns that that was brought up was was the uh, the idea of meetings being held publicly and the fact that there are staff that might be more reluctant to bring issues forth if they thought that you know they, they were going to be doing that in a public manner and so so that's that's a matter that we have to figure out procedurally I, I think there are some solutions I'm confident that there are some solutions to that and uh, so then the other the other issue is that they weren't idea open to the idea of a non-district person being part of the uh, of a, a labor management committee, and would, they'd be more accepting of the uh, public health official in an advisory role. They also wanted the superintendent to be present because of his ability to make decisions and to provide the broadest swath of information to the committee. Um, they also wanted, as I'm doing tonight, these these matters to be brought to the school committee before meeting again. And then the the, uh, the major area of agreement that we had was that the scope and the purpose of the JLMC is not as a decision-making body, but an advisory committee. And so, so hopefully at some point, either tomorrow or Thursday, but before 4 p.m. on Friday, we can we can meet and kind of come to an agreement as, as to how we can best meet and, and do the work and keep it going forward. So that's basically all I have on that so far. So it's helpful, thank you. Um, Ms. Lord. Tomorrow at 6 p.m. there will be a school equity task force meeting. Thank you. Mr. Demling. So on, on the JLMSC um, situation, um, so Mr. Harrington uh, shared that the, there was some concerns expressed about um, the membership that, that the district has, has chosen to to represent the district i i just wondering like uh is, is there anything in the moa that says the district can choose its own representatives or the district's representatives have to be approved um i'm just i'm just sort of wondering about what the required parameters as dictated by the the agreement are in that respect did you want to respond mr harrington or yeah, um, I, I, I kind of scoured the MOA for lang language that, that would limit who we could have in, involved, and there, there really isn't anything that, that limits who the district could have as a, as a member, nor, nor is there anything that limits who the APEA can have as, as members. Um, I don't know does, if anyone else could, could refute that, but that, that's, that's what I read. I see um, some thumbs up coming from our uh, team that was on the negotiations team here. So, good. Any other questions or announcements? Seeing none, we'll move on now to our um, new and continuing business. And our first item is um, discussion on advocacy for the MCAS moratorium. Um, and I'm not sure that that's actually the, the best phrasing for that. That's my fault for how it's phrased on the on the agenda. But um, there, as, as Mr. Demling alluded to when we were reviewing the minutes, or minutes from the last meeting, um, the Mass Association of School Committees um, at their annual convening or delegate meeting um, approved a resolution regarding the MCAS. Um, and I, I actually don't have a copy of that in front of me, but among the items of regarding the MCAS was a moratorium for this year and upcoming two more years. So three years of a moratorium, as well as I think it was a waiving of requirements for high, requirement for high school graduation this year. Um, there's also a, a bill being proposed um, I think in the state Senate or the state legislature regarding MCAS. And I'm, I see Mr. Demling nodding, so maybe Mr. Demling can speak to that bill. But that's um, 
what we want to discuss tonight is whether we as a committee want to weigh in on any of those resolutions as a committee um, uh, or show support for any of those. Mr. Demling, did you do you have that? Yeah, so so the bill that you're talking about is um, is is currently being considered at, at the Senate. Uh, it's uh, proposed by by Senator Comerford. And I'm just reading off her website here. Um, the little blurb uh, summary is that the bill has two main aims, imposes a four year moratorium on the administration of the MCAS and on using any standardized tests to make high stakes decisions about students, educators, schools and districts. The bill also mandates the DESE request the necessary federal waiver and two establishes a statewide commission and local task forces to pilot alternative approaches and re reassess the state's approach to goal setting and evaluation. Um, so that, that differs from the resolution that was recently passed at the MASC Delegate Assembly slightly. Um, the, the MASC resolution um, calls for a waiver of the graduation requirement for this year, um, a moratorium for three years, um, and I, I, th I think that's it. Um, so the, the other sort of piece here is that there's a federal, Dr. Morris could probably speak to the law a little more clearly than I could. There's a federal requirement um, for, 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 for some lo level of standardized testing um, that, that, that we, we, we can't control unless, unless the federal government uh, actually uh, issues a waiver, right? So there's, so that's, that w that was one thing that could happen is that the federal government either now or after January 21st um, could issue a, a federal waiver. Uh, in addition, even if, even if we, the federal government doesn't issue a federal waiver and, and we have to do a, a standardized test, we could um, advocate at the state level for, for waiving the graduation requirement. So that kind of takes the high stakes, it takes most of the high stakes stress out of it, right? It's still stressful, obviously, to sit down there with a standardized test um, that you want to do well on. It's supposed to be the summary of your um, of your of your knowledge and ability and whatever. Um, but but taking that uh, out, out of the requirement for graduation is is what the push is this year. And I think it's really two things, right? One is obviously it's COVID time. And so um, for students that missed um, regular learning this past spring and are missing what would be regular in-person learning now. Um, I think the basic idea is that it's, it's not fair to ask someone to, to do that in a high stakes way. Um, I think there's also, um, and, and you, you heard this in, in that second part of the, the Comerford bill, um, you know, there's been a, a push for a long time to reform standardized testing and how do we evaluate student achievement and keep track of that uh, while being in compliance with the federal law. And so I, th I think there are some groups um, statewide that are sort of looking at this as an opportunity to kind of expand the moratorium on MCAS and, and reevaluate the whole notion of standardized testing. Um, so there's a lot of ways to go, um, you know, a, little, a lot of angles to take, small or large, uh, but that's, that's kind of the, the, the um, that's kind of the setup. Any comments? Ms. Seeger. I was reading, uh, on the MASC listserv about MCAS scores being linked to scholarships. I don't really know anything about it. Um, and, and, it's, and my kids are young enough that the only MCAS I've taken are in, in the younger grades where it's not such high stakes. Um, but I don't know if anyone knows about that. And um, it, in general for the older students for the scholarship, um, it, I mean, I, and there's also like this high stakes part um, that Mr. Demling was talking about and like reducing that, but it still feels pretty awful to maybe have them in the first place because then you have teachers prepping for it and students working towards that. And everyone has a different model across the state right now. So there's just this huge unequalness. Like how, do, how can you possibly compare the students this year? Which I think is, you know, the whole point of why we're talking about this in the first place. So I think I'm, um, restating the somewhat obvious, but uh, circling back, does anybody know about these scholarships and would we be doing our students a disservice by advocating for not holding it? And I don't know, I'm sort of questioning this as I say it and it, it, my thoughts are a little bit unorganized in this area, but. Did you have your hand up, Mr. Demmer? Yeah, so it's called the Adams Scholarship. I think it's the Abigail Adams Scholarship. Um, 
but basically, basically it's a state level scholarship that um, is, is based on, it's either, it's either taking the MCAS or it's, or it's an MCAS score. I don't know the actual rules, but basically the, the, the concern that has been expressed on the, on the listserv there uh, is that if you don't offer the MCAS, then you are, you're denying eligibility to this scholarship. Um, it's obviously an open discussion. I, th I think the, the comments that I've read have said that, well, if, if we ever got into a situation where statewide there was, you know, a temporary moratorium on the MCAS, there's nothing that would prevent the state from changing the requirements for that, for that scholarship. Um, I think, I think maybe the, the, the it would, it would get, if, if you started to do something, I don't even know if you could do this. I, if, uh, I don't even know if we could act on our own and say we're not going to have a graduation level requirement just at Amherst Pelham and the rest of the state can do its own thing. Dr. Morris could probably speak on that, but I, I, I do believe this requires a state level uh, change. We can't just on our own school committee decide, nope, it's not a graduation requirement. It requires a state level thing. Is that true, Dr. Morris? Yeah, so in Massachusetts currently based on uh, regulations, um, unless they change or are waived as, as is being discussed, um, we were, it's a competency determination, right? So if you don't pass MCAS, there's there's another pathway, but it's it's you, you can um, you can get you get noti notification that you you finished high school, but it's not a it's not a diploma in the same way. And so that's I think the piece that is probably garnering the most, um, in my opinion, rightfully garnering the most attention and energy is we've we've got now a year and a half. Um, We'll have a year and a half of really different experiences, um, and that's not district specific. I mean, every district is unique, every kid is unique. But um, so, how would one make sense of uh, the stakes of uh, a single test determining uh, something in the middle of a pandemic? So, you know, you could you could see where my uh, leanings uh, lie on that one. Um, but I think that's getting more attention than perhaps some of the other elements because I think it's on the minds of uh, many secondary school families and students. Sorry, I'll stay quiet now. Ms. Lord. Um, I also, I wanna acknowledge that for the most part, the seniors that graduated, most of them have already taken the MCAS, so it won't affect the students that are gonna be entering college in 2020, I mean, 21. So there's still time to figure out the Abigail Adams scholarship. Dr. Morris. Yeah, sorry, I know Ms. Spitzer has her hand up. I think just you may remember last year, I think we talked about it here that um, the state did allow for some degree of flexibility with course completion uh, for students whose interrupt education was interrupted. We did have um, at least one success and maybe two uh, doing that um, through passing courses. And, you know, these are students who had not passed the MCAS. They were 12th grade students. Um, and trying to find an alternate pathway so that they could work towards graduation while taking the MCAS wasn't uh, a viable option for them. So I think Ms. Lord is correct, but I also, there is a, you know, our graduate, our pass rate is very high at Amherst Regional High School, thanks to work with faculty, staff, students, and families. And then there is, there is a population of students every year that don't pass in the first time or the first couple of times. And so that's a, a separate issue is the population of, of students. A, another issue is it all cascades. So if you have 10th grade students this year, which would be the typical time those tests were taken, uh, you know, last year's kids didn't do it. So is the test going to be different? How is the test going to attribute the fact that there certainly is learning loss that occurred in the last uh, eight months? And so I think there's a lot of unanswered questions for me about how this would actually function as is if it had a high stakes element to it. Ms. Spitzer. Thanks. Um, so I guess one question that I have, I'll just start off by saying, I think I'm generally in favor of us um, showing support for um, at least one or if not more of the um, proposals that um, Mr. Demling shared with us. Um, I, and there's one other reason that I'm wondering. So again, my kids haven't um, taken these tests yet. They're too young. But I'm assuming this is something that would be really hard to do virtually or in re in a remote learning environment. Um, and if that's true, it seems like we would really want to, that's an, just another reason in support of potentially doing it. But I'd, I'd love to know more about whether or not that's true. Dr. Morris. 
Yeah, this is actually something that I was going to bring up on the upcoming uh, when we get to the agenda item. Talk about topics for upcoming meetings is um, more sooner than MCAS, although the stakes are somewhat lower. Is the access testing for ELL students that's in January? Um, we got an email from the state to indicate the access test should be taken this year regardless, and they should be done in person. They don't have the capacity to do that, uh, not in person. And so we responded, well, that may not be an option for us in January. And frankly, it may not be an option for other districts in January too. Uh, and so we're, we're still waiting a reply, um, but because that one to Mr. Demling's point occurs before January 21st, uh, it seems perhaps unlikely that um, we'd get, see a change. In, and I, I don't know if that's federal policy. It's one of the things we're trying to look up, but um, I have not heard of a plan for how tests could be administered remotely. I know some colleges, um, universities have developed software that, you know, to do that, that has like, um, and not to be weird about it, but like a big brother feature where there's like a camera on or something like that. Um, but uh, in my conversations that the commissioner has with superintendents, um, it has not been, and probably rightfully so, been at the forefront of what we're talking about. Um, but I think now that we're into mid-November and Thanksgiving is around the corner, we are getting into the period where we need to, we would need to actively plan for any one of the scenarios that might emerge. So, sorry, long-winded, but the access one in January is, is acutely on our mind because that's two months out. Mr. Denlin, could you um, remind us what the four, I wrote down four components to the bill that's um, on deck. Um, could you remind us what they were? I was trying to scribble. Yeah, sure. So for the Comerford bill, you mean? Yes, sorry. So it says uh, the bill, I'm just reading, um, hang on, I can put the link in the chat if you want. Um, uh, so the, the bill has two main aims, imposes a four-year moratorium on the administration of the MCAS test and on using any standardized tests to make high stakes decisions about students, educators, schools, and districts. This is important too, because um, uh, this is me talking about the bill. Because <laughs> um, uh, we, we've, we've been talking about the student experience here, but um, there's also a broad discussion, right, about how teacher evaluations should occur and be structured and to what degree standardized testing should play a role in that. Um, school, schools and districts also get rated by the state um, uh, and, and MCAS tests play a role in that as well. So this is about, this, this bill is about suspending all of that. Um, bill also mandates the DESE request the necessary federal waiver. So asking that, that the, we get the federal thing. Um, and number two establishes a statewide commission and local task forces to pilot alternative approaches and reassess the state's approach to goal setting and evaluation. That's the that's the Comerford bill, and I, I I'll I'll just say too for my my two cents you know I'm I'm generally in in favor of at the very least a moratorium on um, on MCAS as a graduation requirement for for this year and for next year um, and for the um, the uh, what, what was it the sophomores who to, who who missed taking it um, in the spring I might be getting that year wrong yeah um, I think that's pretty straightforward I mean. Uh, in terms of like fairness, um, I, I I do think um, I, you know I'm I'm also generally in favor of of taking a pause and reevaluating how we do assessments. Um, I I do just personally having followed this discussion for a number of years, I, I I do find it a little polarized, a little too reductionist when we talk about standardized tests. I don't I'll just say publicly I don't think standardized testing is pure evil <laughs> um, one way or another. I, I, I think it can definitely be implemented irresponsibly and ineffectively, but um, you know, broadly speaking, we have a responsibility as a district, right? To make sure that we're, um, uh, that we're not, that we're not um, uh, leaving kids behind, you know, for lack of a better word that, you know, we have to, and if we are doing, um, if, if we're not reaching certain groups uh, as well as others, then we need to correct that. And and there really is no way to just qualitatively walk through the building and absorb that through osmosis other than through some sort of quantitative assessment. And so, of course, the question is, how do you do that in a responsible way that respects student well-being and is age appropriate and is equitable? And that's a really interesting discussion. But I do think it's, it's less, um, it, it is, I should say, it's more complicated than just, you know, MCAS bad and we need to just, you know, not do standardized tests. Um, 
So all that being, that doesn't stop me from saying we should we should have moratorium on MCAS. I think we should, given the pandemic. But um, but it is interesting once you get into once you broach this discussion, it it, it does quickly become non non simplistic. Just just my two cents. I, I, um, I, I would echo and, and sort of plus one um, much of what you just said, Mr. Demling, because I, I agree um, a moratorium or at least a waiver of the requirement for that as, as graduation seems like the most fair and equitable approach given this tremendously unique, disruptive couple of years that we're having. Um, so I, I'm all in favor of, of supporting that. Um, and I also agree that given sort of all the, you know, the challenges and issues as all the ones that you've just described um, from equity, fairness, et cetera, from, from a, the way the MCAS might be administered, that it's a great initiative to pilot and investigate and explore developing new approaches to that. What I really worry about is, is having that, is, is missing that data for us to be able to measure, engage how we are doing in, in educating our students on a sort of, on a quantitative basis, as you said, short of going into buildings. Um, and, and knowing that what we're really striving for, particularly everybody is, but particularly in our district, we talk about looking for um, uh, our, our education gaps and, and sort of education deficits and how do we track that and how we're doing and, and improving in that area. And I don't know how we do that without quantitative data assessment data. And I would also add, though, in theory, I, 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 the idea of a moratorium during a pandemic makes sense on the surface to me. At the same time, part of me thinks like of all the times that we really need to know what, how much we need to make up, this is the time that I feel like we really would need the data to know how far behind we've fallen, um, given um, given the disruptions of these years. So I'm, I'm actually really hesitant to sort of sign on to a full scale moratorium on it beyond sort of the moratorium of, of it as a graduation requirement or any of the, I like that wording in the bill of that any high stakes use of the data um, is, is really helpful because um, it, it's really difficult to hold folks accountable in a pandemic right now in that way. What are, um, so I just spoke a long time, but what are other folks thoughts, anybody who hasn't spoken? Ms. Dancer? I guess I would just say I really appreciate the, the um, comments, your thoughts about it, Peter, and you, Allison, also, you know, are perhaps things that, that I wouldn't have thought of myself. And it does, um, it does speak to some you know, that it's not just one way or the other, you know, because what I've seen, which is not nearly as much as you've observed, is that it is kind of a either or, you know, we either do it or we don't do it. And I think your comments are very helpful for me. Um, and I'm going to look at the MASC information or two um, to understand more about it. So thank you. Does anybody else want to add on? I'm, I'm hearing um, a general interest in, in some sort of advocacy and support, on, at least on pieces of this. Um, and I guess the question is, is, is what, how many of those pieces do we want to, do we want to as a committee in, include? So I would, I would suggest that a next step would be to draft a resolution if that's something that we wanted to do. I'm guessing it was a long day for everybody. Everybody's pretty quiet. <laughs> okay, well, we can um, we can come back to that when we talk about agenda planning. How about that? Okay. So we'll move on to the um, next item of uh, business, which is our distance learning attendance update, um, and that presentation is in our packets. Um, and for folks watching at home, just as a reminder, the packet is, I believe, posted on the on the agenda's webpage. So if there is difficulty viewing it online, you, you can grab it there and the presentation is included in there. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Morris. 
Thank you. So um, two weeks ago, I sort of foreshadowed um, that there were some discrepancies in attendance data. Um, and so that had come back in two weeks when we, um, the administrative team had more time to think about it, hear from staff, hear from uh, families and hear from students uh, and more time to ask more questions about the data. So what I'd like to do tonight is just walk through. Um, it was um, as, a, as a piece of context, I know the first slide says context, but I'll, I'll start even before it. Um, the administrative team uh, started this work uh, looking at attendance in the first month of school as seen as research would suggest it's a predictor of attendance throughout the school year. Um, so we started that work early. Uh, when we got the student feedback uh, responses, from the middle school, high school students, we noticed a trend of responses that was not demographically consistent with our student population. We then went back in to see uh, the attendance data and try to triangulate the, those data sources. Uh, and then we kept on digging and digging and digging. So the administrative teams met more or less every day, every other day for the last two weeks on this topic. Um, I have oodles and oodles of Google Docs and slide decks that we just were filled in as we, we followed data protocols. And so um, this is uh, eight more slides after the type, the front slide, but uh, it's really summarizing a tremendous amount of work and effort that building principals, assistant principals, and others, uh, central office staff have done because it's this is a really important topic. Um, so I just, I think the narrative is important that it wasn't just data that was thrown together. I also want to thank uh, Kong Chen, who works in our IS department, who um, often people who work in IS are you know, behind the scenes, quite literally, uh, in what they're doing. And uh, as we've done our data protocols, she's gotten uh, literally dozens of data questions, uh, which is part of our protocols, from administrators. She keeps on digging in deeper, digging in deeper, and finding more and more data um, to share with administrators that often are specific to their building. Um, so, um, oh, I didn't share my screen yet. Oh, sorry about that. Um, Hopefully folks can see that. Um, and so, you know, again, offering a bit more context, uh, I wanna start by saying this isn't a new conversation. Since last spring, we've had staff members, teachers, paraeducators uh, tell us that they were concerned about some of the attendance patterns they were seeing. They were concerned about who was showing up for class and who was not. Um, so again, this is not a new issue, but we now have much better data to track and a much more robust distance learning approach. Um, so it is a new conversation that way, but it's really part of a, a much longer conversation about how do we make sure that our students are accessing distance learning and have full access to the curriculum. So, you know, I'm not going to read the slide, but I think that first bulleted point is really important. Um, this is not, uh, none of this should be read as a critique of, of families, of students, of staff. Everyone's doing the best they can, uh, an incredibly difficult situation. This is really about understanding uh, what's happening and figuring out what we can do as a district to improve the experience and improve the outcomes, particularly the outcomes um, of, some, of some students in our district. Talking to other districts, nothing in this slide deck uh, feels unique. Um, you know, some of this has been publicly reported. Some of this is just conversations with other districts. I was on an MSAN conference call, as I mentioned today. Uh, similar districts across the country are seeing these similar trends. So. Uh, that doesn't mean it's okay. It doesn't mean we're gonna be satisfied or I'm satisfied with the data, but it also is important to note that many staff are, are innovating and recognizing this challenge uh, and coming up with new strategies that are proving to be effective. So it, it is a work in progress, but we do wanna have an honest conversation tonight. Uh, you know, I think after I referenced it last time, frankly, there were some staff members who, who uh, community members weren't that pleased with me uh, about disclosing it. For me, there's, there's two reasons I think this needs to come to school committee and the public. One, I think it's a matter of public concern. If we have demographic differences and something as important as attendance, uh, I think that should be talked about in a public setting. Uh, the second is, I think ethically, morally, we feel like our job as educators is to make sure every student is reached every student's engaged and every student's learning. And, and right now we have some evidence that is concerning on that front as it relates to distance learning. Um, you know, just to read some data on absenteeism and I, I won't read all of it, but um, you know, talking about longitude and research, um, achievement in reading and math um, is hindered for students who are chronically absent as early as kindergartens. So this isn't just thinking about high school students and credits that they need for graduation. Uh, chronic absence in elementary schools in, is linked to an increased likelihood of dropout, even if attendance improves over the time. In other words, students with poor attendance in elementary school, even if their improvements, attendance improves later, are still more likely to uh, drop out of high school. Uh, low income students are more vulnerable. Research indicates that the negative consequences for chronic absenteeism, 
absenteeism in kindergartners is 75% larger than the impact of absenteeism in higher income classmates. In other words, if we, we know that we have an opportunity gap right now in educational debt, so this is even more important for some of our students uh, and the students that we feel like are the most underserved in our district. Uh, middle high school, not surprisingly, the effects of chronic absenteeism compounds by sixth grade, even along with GPA, it's a top predictor of dropout. So all that data is just suggesting that um, we can't teach students well if they're not in our classes, uh, right? Seems obvious, and that there's long-term impacts uh, of attendance challenges for students. Um, I think it's also worth noting we're not looking looking at this issue from a dis disciplinary approach. This is not, you know, you, you, I think last spring we heard some terrible examples that made the media uh, on districts that were rushing um, to dole out pretty serious consequences on family and students for attendance challenges. We are consistently trying to um, have a supportive approach and not a disciplinary approach as it relates to student attendance. Um, you know, and this is this is a journey for us that you know we have a you know we have a uh, district improvement plan at the regional level that that highlights in the elementary school element ones that highlight the opportunity gaps as a critical component of our district. And if attendance is so highly correlated with achievement, we need to take this topic really seriously. Um, I, I want to also be clear, it's not on the slide, but I just want to say it out loud um, because I know we're working not just in Amherst, but everywhere in a politicized environment. This is not something that I'm suggesting uh, should be used to whether an MOA should be revisited or whether, right, I don't have a political goal in here. This is about kids. It's about how do we take care of kids, particularly those who are historically underserved in our district, because uh, we're concerned about the trends we're seeing. So I can't control what anyone else does with data. Right, I, I've learned that. I don't know if it's the hard way, but I've learned that <laughs> in my time in this role in this community. At the same time, I want to be really clear that there's no political end except how do we help kids be successful and how do we promote them to have the uh, the best outcomes possible uh, in our district. So I know it's an awkward thing to sort of talk about, but I want to talk about it clearly here because I think it is a critical component that um, that I heard is like, you know, is there an ulterior motive? There's no ulterior motive. The motive is we collectively have to figure out how to reach um, some of our students in a different way than we are right now. And that's it. Sorry, that was a long-winded context piece, but I thought it was just important because anytime you present data, again, once I start presenting it, you know, the train moves. And uh, before I got to the station, I thought I'd um, share those pieces. So um, here's some summary points, because once you do, right, uh, there's a lot in the data, but, um, the overall student attendance rate is pretty similar to last year's when we were in person. We, hey, Mr. Sullivan, how you doing? Um, when we when we compared it, we tried to compare apples to apples, so we compared the same dates, which were mid September to early November. Uh, you know, because attendance patterns change once you get to winter for a whole host of reasons. You know, people get sick more often, as Mr. Sullivan knows. The roads can be a little tricky in some of our towns that may have influence uh, on attendance. So. We did an apples to apples comparison from fall of 19 to fall of 20. Um, the one caveat I'd have that the attendance is similar is that um, it's, uh, it sounds kind of hokey, but it's actually pretty hard to cut class once you're in the school, right? It takes a lot of effort. Uh, the way we're calculating attendance is students who are present in their homeroom are present at the beginning of the day. And we've received anecdotal reports from many teachers that uh, that doesn't necessarily describe someone, uh, a student's full day's attendance. Um, that they may be in at the beginning of a class period, the middle school, high school, they may not stay online for the whole class period. So I think the one caveat I'd have is that um, when students are in school, we have, we have a real good sense of that. Uh, we are trying to change our data systems, I'll talk about later to, to capture a little bit more of that, but I, I did want to say um, they're pretty similar. So the concern is really about the distribution of absences uh, more than it is the total number. Um, so, you know, very bluntly, and I'll read this, that um, absences of students identifying as Latino, Latina, Black, African-American, English language learners, and students qualifying for subsidized lunch are disproportionately high, higher than they've been in the past. Um, students identifying as male also have a disproportionate share of, share of absences. It's not quite at the same um, statistical significance, and that's why I made it its own bulleted point, um, but, but it's also true. We have recently seen signs of improvement based on staff actions. I want to thank staff for all of their work, but the gaps are still present and we still need more actions to, and we need to take more actions because if we don't do anything, uh, we would expect the data to, to not change. And that's not acceptable in my opinion. Any questions before I dig in on some of the
quantitative numbers and quantitative data. Okay. Not seeing any. No. All right, we'll keep going. So uh, two data sets. Uh, we had uh, probably 40 sheets of Excel files that Kong put together for us. I'm only going to share two uh, to not overwhelm. They, they often tell the same story. Uh, they may be more localized to a school, and the principals all have access to that. But what you see on the left is 2019. Um, the percent of well, the top line is, you know, uh, the attendance looks slightly better this year. So 4.7% absences. Uh, last year was about five at five percent, so not a huge difference. But uh, again, with the caveat I mentioned before, the concerning piece is really looking at the percent of the population, the percent of the absences. So I'll look at like free free lunch, for instance. So students who qualify for the free lunch program uh, last year were thirty four point six percent of the student population. They they approximated about forty four percent of the absences. So there was already a distinction there. Um, the challenge here is that number, not much of a change in the percent of the population, uh, but we're now up to 62% roughly of the absences are attributed to students who qualify for free lunch. So it's nearing twice, uh, a disproportionality that's twice the percentage of their role, their, um, that population of students in the general population. Uh, also concerning, or um, you can look down, I'm not gonna read all the numbers, um, African American students, Black or African American, which last year um, that subgroup had better attendance than the mean, um, and this year does not. Um, and even though the relative numbers are low, the change is, is to me pretty significant uh, over a six week span. Um, as I mentioned, ELL students and Hispanic Latino students also are overrepresented in the absences in pretty dramatically um, different ways than they were in the fall. Um, so this, this is a, a huge cause of concern for us. This is, you know, anytime we're looking at our systems, we consistently try to look at who's benefiting from what we're doing. And this is telling us that not all of our students are benefiting and particularly that the trends that we're seeing um, are trends that we would not want to see. Um, historically underserved populations in our district, um, we're not being successful. There's some success stories in there. Um, so I don't want to kind of dismiss them, particularly special education, so kudos uh, to folks working on that, because that's taken a tremendous amount of effort. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll get to my hypothesis as to why that number looks better this year uh, a little later in the presentation. So I have one more data set that I'd like to uh, present, but I want to pause and see if there's either comments or questions on the one that is up in front of the screen now. Mr. Demling and then Ms. Spitzer. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the two things that strike me about this chart, one is that we're not talking about a couple percentage percentages here in one or two groups. I mean, for 33.7% of the population being free lunch and then representing 61.9% of the absences is, is extreme. Um, so it's the, it's the magnitude of, of the, of the, how unbalanced it is, is, is striking. The, the other thing that's striking to me is other than special education, this is every single achievement gap subgroup, every single historically underserved subgroup, every, every every subgroup of students and families who are underserved in society, <laughs> other than special education in this chart, um, are, are disproportionately missing missing class. Um, so yeah, I look forward to the next slides. But those, those are the two things that really are striking to, to, to me in this. Ms. Spitzer. So, um, this is more kind of a getting in the weeds a little bit. I'm trying to figure out how, whether I'm reading this right. So the absence rate is the 4.7 and the 4.9 number. So if there's a classroom of 20 kids on a given day, we'd expect about one kid to be absent. And that was true in 2019 and 2020. So do you have the absence rates for these subpopulations? And, and are you seeing the same trend, I guess, at the absence rate? Because I, I think it's interesting. I, I mean, this is clearly showing that there, there's, there's a, a problem. I'm just trying to understand, are we seeing such big gaps as well in, in the rate of absence for these subgroups? And maybe you don't have that data, but... Um, we do a different way to present the same data, right? Because this is showing the disproportionality. And, and so it's, it, that's stemming from the higher rates of absence among those sub, subgroups. But I guess it would be possible that you could still have, and this is again, just thinking in the weeds, is that you could still have a lower, so if our, if our overall absence rate is actually lower than last year, potentially you could still have lower than last year's 
abstinence rates for some of these groups and ha still have this disproportionality that would be problematic. But I'm just wondering, is if we're seeing, as well as this trend, like, are we seeing rates that have gone up considerably as well as this kind of disproportionality among who's actually having the days? Yeah. So, Sorry. So no, no, no. I can give a really brief answer to this one. Yeah. I know sometimes I give long-winded answers. The answer is yes. We're seeing the same, you know, increase in rates as well. Yeah. And I'll get to that in the next slide. I think that'll become a little bit more clear. Are there any other questions on this slide? No? Yeah, I think before I go to the next slide, you know, in the workshop today, um, uh, the facilitator used a quote that I'll read uh, from James Baldwin, which is not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And so I just, I, I thought that was a really good quote and I, I told her I'm probably gonna use it today uh, because I do think this is uncomfortable to look at and it's still really important to look at. And sometimes that uncomfortability um, it brings about the changes that benefit kids. And, and that's, you know, I just wanna note the, that it's, it's awkward for me to talk about it. And I've been living in this data for a couple of weeks, uh, but for people who are seeing it for the first time or processing it first time, I just, I want to note that it's it's not it's not easy it's not fun to look at and it's not consistent with you know what we want to be in the district and that's why we're talking about it. So the other data set I uh, put in the slide deck shows um, greater than five absences from the time periods that you see from the first day of distance learning uh, through the sixth. Um, and so this is looking at um, similar kinds of um, you know structures. I added a couple more. Uh, demographic pieces to it, um, but um, it's trying to see, you know, it, I don't really love the term, but, you know, what would be considered chronic absences, you know, so for uh, the first, you know, six weeks of school or whatever it worked out to be there, having five absences is missing, you know, basically once a week, um, thereabouts, and so that's about 20 percent, you know, I think the actual number ended up being, I think we calculated, it was like 17.8 percent uh, or more, um, absence rate. And so you see the same trends emerge. I think Kong put um, some green colors for uh, demographic groups that um, are faring, are having fewer, um, as a proportion, fewer uh, chronic absence, um, students who are, ha who, are who are displaying chronic absences, um, and then red to show where that's increased, and it's following the same trends. Um, so it's not really new data, but I think one of the things when we get to what we're going to do about it is trying to see where are there students who, you know, may have been sick for a couple of days. We know that even in a virtual environment, you know, things happen. There was a power outage day and Steve, I think there was another day. Uh, this was a Monday. Their Shootsbury had, was out um, for a little bit. So we want to be realistic to know that there are things that happen when we get over five, then that's when, you know, the, the easy, easily to explain absences, like I didn't have power that day, that sort of falls, falls apart a little bit. Uh, and unfortunately, we're seeing the same trends as we saw. Again, I mentioned earlier that we were seeing a bit of a trend with uh, female students and male students as well that wasn't addressed in the earlier slide. Um, and I know it's a lot of data. It, again, we've got, I mean, I think Kong has literally gotten 40, 40 sheets of um, Excel files, um, some of that gets to identifiable levels when we get to the school specific. And so I thought it was better to share the district specific, but the schools all have um, their own specific and they actually have the students um, who the students are attached to this in terms of the greater than five absence list in terms of interventions and supports that can be offered. Um, but, you know, we wanted to look at this to see, um, to cross-reference it with the first data set and, and you know, sort of unfortunately it cross-referenced um, all too well uh, when we compared uh, this year's data to last year's data. Any questions on this one? I know this one has like additional, it's a little harder to, talk about, but it, it, you know, the short story is it's showing the same trends are true from the earlier slide uh, on the chronic absence uh, rate as well as the more routine one. Ms. Stancer. Um, this is maybe obvious, but I, but I wanted to ask, so students could fall into more than one of these groups. Yep. Yeah. So there's a, we looked at that and, and one of our, our current aspects of work is looking at, uh, you know, what we would say is comorbidity. So if you happen to be um, I'll give you a, a really example that we dug in on. Um, Hispanic Latino students, uh, regardless of income, um, so in other words, in both students who receive subsidized lunch and students who don't, 
had higher rates of absences than um, the, the mean, uh, but there was a there was a difference between students in that ethnic subgroup who also qualified for free or reduced lunch. Um, so we are able to get in that details again for this particular presentation. Um, it started getting uh, the the end size on some of those. The number of students started getting just felt uncomfortable for a public presentation. But on a principal level, what you're suggesting is absolutely where they're digging in to trying to look at what are the trends? How do we get to the individual student characteristics? Uh, but I think what we learn looking at that is that both things are true, that uh, it's like many things. Um, so socioeconomic class has had an influence, um, but even cut across that race ethnicity as a unique variable, like, you know, with, with other things, uh, you know, uh, had a very, had an, was a definite difference regardless of socioeconomics. Um, so both things can be true, right? There could be comorbidity and it still matters um, regardless of the income. And the same thing for special ed or, you know, a whole number of other, because um, it's not just race, ethnicity, it's, it includes other demographic groups as well. Sorry, my answer to Carrie's was much shorter and more direct, so I'll get better. Ms. Lord. Is the state allowing some leeway in terms of when you are required or requested to report this to higher agencies in terms of chronic attendance? So I will answer that question very carefully to say that we are taking a, um, we are doing our absolute uh, most to take a non-disciplinary, non-reporting approach, given the pandemic, given the challenges that students are facing. We'll talk about those in a second. Um, to, so we are trying to avoid going down roads that you suggest. Um, and we're not so worried about the other part of what would happen to us, right? If we have real concerns about neglect or abuse, you know, we are mandated, every staff member here is a mandated reporter and we do what we are, are we fulfill that duty. We are taking that into account heavily as it relates to attendance and really coming from a problem solving approach and not relying on external agencies um, unless we feel like there's real neglect happening. Ms. Spitzer? I'm just wondering because the grade level isn't indicated here and I'd imagine um, it may differ so that I, I could imagine younger students who can't be left at home alone or who can't na navigate remote learning might be more likely to have um, absences. Are we seeing any trends across age groups? I know you can't get into like specific yeah, no, but yeah, I can answer that. So we're actually seeing there's not huge differences, but the, the most elevated, uh, the worst attendance numbers are at the middle school. Um, my personal hypothesis about that is that it, for many families is the, they are the youngest students who many families feel comfortable leaving alone. Um, you know, we don't have situations where first graders are left alone. Uh, they may not have a parent or caregiver, the caregiver may be an older sibling. Um, but um, I think that, uh, in my opinion, that contributes to a slightly elevated um, challenge as it relates to attendance. Um, so that that's sort of, you know, in terms of trends, everybody's more or less in the same ballpark. Um, but uh, the middle school is definitely seeing uh, a slightly elevated number. But I, I attribute it. And, and I also really wonder about the developmental piece um, as well. But um, just anecdotally, um, there are more families who are um, feeling comfortable from a uh, maturity perspective that they can leave a middle school or home alone for some amount of time. Um, and then, you know, these are students who are 12, 13, and 14, and we're helping them try to make the best decisions they can as they go through pre-adolescence. So uh, I don't have hard data on that. That's anecdotal um, conjecture, um, but I think it's informed conjecture. Um, uh, but yeah, we have looked at the grade level specific um, numbers and we have that, we have that available. Not seeing other questions. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the next slide summarizes feedback that was completed. Uh, I really want to thank Marta Guevara, uh, who is the director of the Family Center. She provided uh, focus groups and, and individual conversations with family met, uh, with families with students um, who are struggling with attendance. Um, she she plays a large role um, in supporting schools and then taking on a larger role at district at a district level as it relates to challenges with attendance and supporting families. Um, so this is, these are direct uh, comments. We did our own root cause analysis as a leadership team and actually, and we hadn't seen this document when we started, 
and um, it was interesting comparing them, but I, I actually put more stock in what um, families and students are saying than what someone like I would say. So I, I don't want to read the slides, but I think there's some familiar themes for families. Um, we have many families who caregivers need to work. Um, looking nationally, there's a huge disparity, um, racial, racial ethnic disparity on caregivers who have to go into the office who can't work remotely and, and folks who can. Um, we don't have that data locally, but there's sort of no reason why that wouldn't, might not be true here as well. Um, and so we wondered if that would have an impact. Um, some caretakers uh, can afford hiring, you know, someone to be with their children. Uh, other families can't. And again, the responsibility falls to older children. You know, one of the anecdotes that came was uh, an eighth grader who's struggling with attendance, uh, who has a fourth grader and a first grader that they're, uh, they have responsibility for. And so uh, I can think of myself as an eighth grader um, struggling enough with <laughs> what I was trying to do in school in person, let alone having two younger siblings um, to try to help with that. And, and so that's a hard problem to solve. Um, it's a really challenging one for, for that family and we're trying to work with them as best we can. Um, you know, the multiple schools and different schedules, and we'll talk about that a little later in terms of um, what, what we're trying to, how we're trying to think about that and support that. Um, and by different schools, they're talking about, we're talking about different levels. So for instance, the middle school schedule and the elementary schedule doesn't, doesn't completely line up. Um, that's what we're referencing. Um, that it's, um, it's hard to support children's learning uh, for caregivers um, for a whole host of reasons. Um, families, even for families who can work from home, that's uh, a challenge and, and some caregivers express that they don't have an academic or educational background uh, sufficient to support some of their children based on the courses they're taking um, and many other factors. Uh, we heard a lot about this in the summer, actually. I think I, yeah, I did talk about this in the summer that uh, depending on the, the size of the home that families have and maybe multiple students working close together, we did purchase the headphones and give those out uh, and that helped some, but um, if you have multiple siblings, you uh, multiple children or multiple siblings, you know that there, there's some distractibility of being close to someone else, even if they're theoretically trying to do something else on a screen. And so that's coming up a lot. Uh, and also that children, uh, there are siblings who are not yet school-aged um, who um, you know, can be distracting. On the student side, what we heard is that motivation's a, a challenge and being home all the time is, is a real challenge. We heard about that last night from the Bright presentation as well. Um, that some students are reporting that online school is just not engaging. They miss the interpersonal contact, uh, contact they have. Classes, sometimes it feels like all they're doing is homework because it is a lot of independent work that students are doing. Um, and just the email load. We all, you know, you as school member in my role, uh, I think we all collectively struggle with the email load and students are, are receiving many notifications and, and I think people are working on good systems for that, but that's also a challenge. So uh, this is coming directly from some of our families who are struggling and I just, again, appreciate that we're getting uh, that group of, of folks' opinions, um, thoughts, and experiences really um, into the conversation. Any questions uh, before I talk about what steps we have taken and what steps we plan to take? No questions. Oh, Ms. Kenny. So I really appreciate all of the outreach um, Dr. Guevara did for this. And I would also venture that, I mean, I know in my household that the things that these families are struggling with, okay. even kids who are able to attend and, and participate um, more are still struggling with lots of these same things. So I, I think these are fairly universal feelings um you know some definitely worse for others i'm not trying to take away any of that but i, I think these are um you know wider spread too thank you Ms. Kenny. okay okay so uh, i mentioned earlier that st uh, staff have taken some strong steps that we've seen some improvements in the data um you know i think the first one's the most important one, that uh, building relationships has been critical. We knew going into this year, it was gonna be really challenging to build relationships starting the year in a virtual context. And for the vast majority of our students, that's all they've had this year. And so, you know, uh, I think the key phrase that we keep hearing is non-email communication. That emails are fine, there's nothing bad with them, but in terms of building that relationship, um, that's been really critical and that individualized approach. Um, you know, the, the conversation can't be 
what's wrong with your attendance, right? That, that's actually the last thing that we want to be asking. It's how can we support you giving uh, for staff members who have um, been able to break down some of those barriers for families to feel comfortable to talk about the stresses they're facing. Uh, that seems like that's been uh, an incredibly successful strategy. Um, individual schedules. Um, so, you know, just in terms of um, different courses where students may be in class and then go to speech or have an ELL class, um, you know, trying to work on that uh, with the direct links um, so that people can point and click very easily. Um, again, personalized check-in, check-outs, beginning of day, end of day, uh, pro providing ongoing tech support for families. Um, we have two distance learning centers um, that are happening. Um, they've been going on for the last month or so. Mark's Meadow, which is the Wildwood Aftercare Program uh, and LSSC Daycare Programs. They're both operating in our building, the building I'm in now at the middle school. Um, and I know for, particularly for the Mark's Meadow uh, program that has students from Wildwood uh, attending, I know from hearing from Nick and Allison, the uh, leaders at Wildwood, that's been, they, they've had students who are struggling with attendance and the moments they got into a distance learning center the attendance problems um, seem to really resolve. So many thanks to our partners uh, at Marks Meadow and LSSC uh, for that work, but that's been a, a huge resource for families um, and for students that have helped. Um, case management approaches. So what we mean by case management is, is having a consistent uh, person who's connecting with families, uh, who's trying to support them um, in kind of a holistic approach about some of the challenges they're facing and someone who tracks the data and stays with um, the student and the family. Uh, over time. Uh, we have had um, some in-person support for intensive special needs students that's been um, in homes and that's also been something that has improved um, some of the attendance and, and I think I referenced that earlier the special ed attendance does look look better and appreciate some of that's not only about intensive special needs but I know that that has been hugely beneficial for our intensive needs population who we've heard from many families and I think Peter spoke to this last week in terms of what he heard from CPAC. Um, it, it has made a difference, maybe not optimal, but it has made a difference to have the in-person support in the homes. Um, so I'll pause um, and see if there are questions or comments before we talk about the future action steps that we're, we're developing. Ms. Stancer and then Mr. Deming. Um, can you talk about what the distance learning centers are? Sure. Um, and if Dr. Guevara was here, she'd do a better job than me. Her and Dwayne Chamble deserve a lot of the credit because they're um, really critical to working with our outside providers. But essentially, um, it's their spaces where students um, have their Chromebooks. Um, they have Wi-Fi access because they're in the middle school. And there's an adult um, or there are adults present to, you know, supervise, support, make sure all the health and safety regulations are being followed in terms of distancing, in terms of um, washing hands and sanitizing. Um, but they're essentially daycare centers that we've been able to provide, um, start providing uh, through the help of our partners so that students aren't home doing it. They're doing it with adult support um, in, in a setting that's not at the home. Um, and what we found is, again, for certain families, that's been critical um, in terms of alleviating some of the barriers towards their students actively engaging and attending distance learning. And it's not unique to here. I mean, it's happening if you, if you Google it, it's many, many places um, are partnering with things like YMCA's, um, other community organizations, United Way, some places. Uh, for us, it was our existing partnership with our aftercare providers um, that we were able to build in, but they're doing a phenomenal job. And I love going to see them because it's just nice seeing kids in school. Is that a, is that a follow up, Ms. Dancer? Mm -hmm. um, is there any thought about doing a similar kind of thing? for students, older students? So the current time, uh, it's limited to K to eight. Um, we started at an elementary level, but um, the state, I think I got this right. If not, Dr. Guerrero, she's probably watching, will text me and that'll be good um, and I'll correct myself. But I believe the state loosened some of the requirements. Um, so typically programs that were typically um, K to six uh, in terms of their licensure from the state, um, they were given additional flexibility. So there is a little bit of additional flexibility that way. Um, but these are these are relatively small programs at the moment, this moment in time, um, you know, and they, they got approved for a certain number of students when we weren't sure if, when students were coming back. And we had a plan for, um, you know, at this point, many students being back in the district. So um, I think when we talk about future next steps, um, I can speak to that a little more specifically about, you know, what we might be thinking about. Mr. Denley. Yeah, so um, comment and question. So when I look at all these 
this bulleted list of interventions, I see staffing, 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 staffing. You know, we talk about individualized outreach, individualized schedules, personal check-ins, case management. You need people to do that, right? And, and a couple of weeks ago, we just had a pretty sobering intro to our town finances where we were told that right now we're penciled in for level funding, which means we're gonna cut staff and services for FY22. If, if, I mean, I'll just put that out there. That's, that's the, that's the general, what happens if you, if you have, you know, if your costs go up and your, your money stays the same, you're going to cut staff and services. Uh, if, if that's the case, we're still a long way off from finalizing the FY22 budget. Um, but because of that, um, and this goes to what Ms. Spitzer has said a few times, which is, you know, we're going to need to spend more money next year, not less. And, and this is a prime example of that where even if we do an amazing job this year with, with, with shoring up this, this issue and re-engaging these students, these students aren't gonna start next year and just instantly you know, pick up where they left off. There's gonna be, we're gonna have to help students re-engage. You know? And um, like this, if, if these interventions are effective, that's, it's, that, that need is not going to go away. And I, I feel like um, uh, you know, educating the, the public and the town uh, and the decision makers that, that set the school budgets. Um, this is a very important thing to to be talking about uh, and to say, why do we need not, you know, why do we not just level services? Why do we need extra services? But why do we, are we, do we certainly not want to have level funding? This is, this is a prime example why. So I would just encourage you to, to keep that theme in mind consistently too. It's more than just a you know, one presentation every X number of months. It's a consistent theme. That, I, and I'm sure you'll stay on that. Um, uh, and I, I guess I had the same question about as, as Ms. Stancer did, but if, you, and if you're going to get to it on the next slide, that, that's fine. But, um, you know, the way that you describe the effectiveness of the distance learning centers of how the, the kids come in and then the problem is, is effectively solved, that's, that's very intriguing. And we, um, um, uh, like I, I think Ms. Seeger mentioned um, that the, the or, or um, was it Ms. Uh, Ms. Kenny, um, that these 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 engagement issues aren't just just isolated to to attendance, you know. And so the more that we can expand that opportunity for for students to to be there, um, that that solves uh, or it helps solve a number of problems that the parents and students are are experiencing with with the the current remote learning situation. So. Um, I'm, I'm very interested to see to where we can go that, how, how, how much we can, we can expand that opportunity. Ms. Seeger. Yeah, I was wondering with these distance learning centers, which, yeah, I, I was definitely intrigued to hear, hear more about those. Um, are the families bringing the students in or is there busing? How does that work? It's a great question. So at the current time, it's the families are bringing the students in, but Dr. Guevara is working with our facilities department on seeing what we can do about expanding transportation access, um, particularly to higher density areas. Um, and so we're working on that now. That'll get to a, you all are like, great. You're like little plants. Uh, moving me, not little, but like moving me to the next step. This is, uh, but really this is looking back at what's been successful at um, trying to change the data over the last few weeks um, since this became more apparent as a as a, a real issue and and we'll get to that. I think um, the thing I want to go back to Mr. Demling's point um, earlier is that you know our budget is frozen you know this year except for essential purchases. And so you know I, I think just to highlight you, you talked about next year and I just want to also just remind folks that we are really stemming uh, purchasing this year. Uh, because of some of the challenges we're facing and how expensive it is to try to do both, you know, what we plan for in person in terms of the amount of PPE and other things we bought um, and how to service students in a remote environment is kind of, it, it's just the nature of it is challenging and it's more expensive. Um, so I, I just wanted to, sh to note that as well. Since we've uh, hinted at the next page, maybe we'll move on and, and Steve and Talk about that. Sure. So um, this, the one out of two is just that there's two two slides of um, future action steps. So the first one is each school either defines or refines. Um, some some schools already have some version of this um, and that that looks at attendance and maybe it's an equity working group, um, but has a group that meets regularly to coordinate efforts. Uh, again, identify students who are frequently absent. Um, 
develop that problem solving approach and support system for the students, not a punitive piece as, as we've said multiple times, and, and really looks to identify employees or interns because some of them are doing this work who can serve as case managers and have the family center train them on best practices. So some of this is redeploying um, certain staff members uh, or parts of their roles so that we can be more actively engaging with families at a broader level. It can't just be the counselors, right? It, it can't be the social workers we have currently, uh, counselor social workers on staff. Uh, we do need a broader, uh, broader group working on this and the schools are uh, developing what this would look like at their specific site. Um, and, I, and I appreciate the principles they all want to put that they review data weekly and some of that's with their teams but some of that's actually collectively um, to, to look at progress and to have accountability on the um, how they're doing in terms of the gaps in attendance we're seeing so that it's the progress monitoring is happening routinely and we know if the interventions are working or not and we can of course correct along the way. The second is to learn and share best practices. Um, so I've tasked Dr. Guevara uh, with developing a document and presentation on best practice and promoting positive attendance and building those relationships in a virtual environment that'll be shared with everybody in the district. So, you know, the, the staff members who have found ways to be successful that we're sharing this, how they're doing that much more broadly. So it's not um, kind of the good ideas are shared with a small group, but we want to share them with everyone. Um, one thing that we've learned, and it wasn't really talked about earlier, is that uh, we sometimes have multiple schools working to support the same family, and actually from the family perspective, that can be overwhelming. You know, so if the middle school and one of the elementary schools are both trying to support, again, everyone's trying to do the best work, it's, it's all coming from a, a passionately good place. At the same time, um, if the same issues emerge, how do we as a school district, or districts in this case, how do we work together so that there's a common point of contact for the families that can coordinate um, across that? Because uh, you know we, we've gotten tripped up a couple times, again, only through the best intentions. So we want to make sure that we're, we're actively coordinating our approach uh, to support families in a, in, a, in a manner that will be the most effective. And we know multiple phone calls, multiple emails from multiple schools uh, to, to an individual family uh, may not be the most successful way and actually can, cannot be positively received. And I can, I can understand that 100% uh, from the family percent of point of view. As I mentioned, we talked about this a little bit at MSAN today. I have a um, governing board meeting on Thursday. Um, I said at the beginning, and I say it again, uh, it's not a justification, but we are not unique. Um, I talked to multiple districts today about this issue. They're seeing that are in remote. They're seeing, and they're not in New England, they're uh, mid-Atlantic states, and they're seeing the same trends that we're seeing um, and they're they're equally concerned. So, you know, it is really great to have the Minority Student Achievement Network for us to be able to collaborate with, to hear about what best practices are, to share what we're doing that's working well. I actually shared pieces of this, this presentation with so, some of the people I was in a breakout group with and had a really deep conversation, um, got some ideas I hadn't thought of and then shared some ideas that other people appreciated. So it's really great to have a professional network of districts that uh, want to disaggregate their data, do it routinely, um, and care about these issues in the same way that, that we do here in Amherst. Um, so we are exploring models. We've heard from a number of families about mental health support and the challenges sometimes of, of telehealth that way. So we're exploring models where students might be able to access in-person mental health supports um, that is in the MOA allowable for staff who want to perform that. And we've had some requests of staff uh, who would like to meet with students and we're trying to think of all the best ways to do that. Um, but we know for some families um, and some students, they're, they're indicating that that's a, a critical need. I talked about the vir virtual learning or distance learning centers. Um, so we are starting to have discussions with providers of expanding access to their programming. That's not as easy as it seems. That involves staffing, um, sp space, uh, if they want to expand. We have plenty of space. We have spaces that we know what the ventilation is. But uh, for them to expand, it has to be, the spaces have to be visited by the state and approved by the state. So it's not something that can happen overnight. Um, it's a pretty thorough process. Um, our facilities team has been really helpful when that process is playing out and in working with the providers uh, to make sure the spaces are ready before the evaluators and uh, auditors come in. Uh, but it is something that certainly, as we've seen it, have a positive impact. Um, we're currently trying to expand it with, our, with the current numbers of LSSC and Marks Meadow because they had some empty uh, open slots. Uh, over time, uh, working with them to see if they could expand it even further, um, perhaps beyond the middle school, but into one of the elementary schools as well. Um, we are also um, looking to open a virtual learning center that's specific for our intensive needs population. Um, that's a population that, um, because of the disabilities the students have, don't have access to a more general 
virtual learning or distance learning center. Um, and at the K-12 level, we know that's a population um, that would benefit uh, for a whole host of reasons uh, for receiving you know, services that many students are receiving in homes or receiving it at the at the school building. And and I think we talked about this last week, actually, or CPAC talked about it. Um, from, a, from a ventilation perspective, it, it is much safer uh, for those services to be offered um, so that helps students access distance learning uh, in a space where we know what the ventilation is. Again, the ASHRAE standard for homes is, I think is 0.35 uh, air changes per hour. Uh, the rooms that we're talking about are well over four. Um, so it's a very small group of students, but you know it is sort of transitioning um, that. So again, we don't have any in-person learning school going on. I want to be really clear about that because I know that that would be a political touch point uh, for many people. That's not what we have um, going and that's not what we can have going. Uh, at the same time, virtual learning centers provide a different point of access uh, and, and they can offer different supports and then um, relying just on families or in-home services. So uh, we are looking to see what we can do to expand both of those um, and particularly looking at um, students who uh, most benefit from those services. Um, so, you know, many thanks to our providers who are helping with that uh, at the current time because it is a challenging thing to open and to expand during a pandemic, uh, but it's been a great service for students and they're doing a wonderful job in terms of running those virtual learning centers. So again, can't say enough, my appreciation for Mark's Meadow and, and LSSC uh, for their work. Uh, we want to make sure our systems uh, to better understand data. So one of the things that um, uh, our suggestion from staff that we re I received and others received was uh, having different communication platforms that allow for more like easier ways for staff members to not use their private phone, but to send texts or communicate with families. Um, so we are exploring like the Remind app, uh, which is one of those, um, you know, I think, you know, to be really clear, you know, without going too heady, you know, that's a, that's a technical thing we could change. You know, we also need to do some adaptive changes um, to improve the data that we're seeing, but, you know, we want really, really smart uh, teachers, power educators are advocating uh, that we explore different communication systems and so uh, we really we trust their opinion on this and trying to figure out if there's any slight way we can uh, use cares act funds because this is not free uh, to do that so working with the town on that this week actually uh, with jerry champagne so we are trying to look at other ways we can communicate uh, again to try to get off email um, as for for many students that's not the most effective or many families it's not the most effective method uh, we're also trying to explore systems to understand engagement data. So, you know, all the research would say attendance is proxy for engagement, that the higher level of engagement, um, students who are experiencing a higher level reporting a higher level of engagement, they tend to attend school more often, and students who are feeling disengaged from school um, tend to have more absences. So, you know, uh, many of our schools are using different systems where teachers are trying to uh, self-report the levels of engagement they're seeing in schools at the elementary level, looking at trying to take attendance in the morning and the afternoon, not just in the morning, which is the standard practice that the state recommends and what we typically do. So we are trying to understand the data a little more and, and see if we can refine it uh, to get a little more at the root causes piece. From a teaching and learning perspective, we got a lot of feedback, uh, as, as you saw from staff members, from family members on the learning schedule. And so our elementary leaders and Tim Sheehan are meeting actually later this week to try to take that feedback and see you know, are there modifications or revisions that can be made that would help you know, improve attendance and, you know, really by improving engagement. Uh, one other piece that came out, it came out in the distance learning survey, I didn't talk about it earlier, but one of the key pieces was really the importance of feedback uh, for engagement. Um, that if students are receiving routine feedback, they're more likely to be engaged and more likely to be present. When students are completing work, especially in a virtual environment, which can seem really detached, if there's not active feedback that's being given, um, you know, what we're hearing is that's contributing to students uh, not attending. And so, you know, that was part of the GOA, the professional development that all staff received. And we have some like outstanding examples uh, of that. Um, and we wanna make sure that um, the, the wonderful work that our staff's doing is shared and best practice are shared because we do believe that that actually um, is a critical component to all this. And lastly, we wanna monitor progress in all the action steps, that it's not something like, oh, yep, you know, we check, we did it. Uh, we wanna do things and also then see the impact it's having. And, and attendance is actually, a, uh, it's not easily quantifiable because uh, of all the, the challenges I shared within the variables, but more than other things, it actually is pretty easy to track um, certain aspects of. And so that's gonna be a critical component of all this. Um, 
And, and those are the action steps we've developed. Again, we're open to anyone who's watching this, who's a staff member, who's a community member, um, certainly any of you, you know, please share ideas. We don't feel like we've cornered the market um, on ideas. We don't, we don't feel like that's actually the right paradigm to use. Um, you know, uh, there was an email that this presentation that went out to staff members. I think it got out right as the meeting was starting or a little like over an hour ago, because uh, principals will be, uh, and, and school leaders will be engaging their faculty and staff uh, on this work as well at the building level. And, you know, I, I think this data, when you look at a district, uh, it's really helpful. And then when you get more local to the school and, and that's where it becomes more real for, for most of our staff and faculty. And so all the principals have access and have that data at the school level and can share that with their school-based teams. Um, so as they build out their action steps. And there are some differences between schools. Uh, Pelham's the most, um, sees the most difference in patterns, um, but that the school committee is not here tonight, so I won't reference them too much. Uh, I mean, members are, but the Pelham school committee isn't. But you know, it, the, the trends that you saw that were concerning are pretty consistent across schools. Um, you know, there's varying degrees, but. Uh, there weren't huge disparities in, in the Amherst Elementary schools or the regional schools with this. So that was a lot of me talking, I apologize, but you know, I do think this is a super important topic for us uh, as we're in a remote environment. And we, you know, I think all indications that we will be for an extended period of time. Um, and so I'm sorry for the long-winded nature of it, but I really didn't want to shortchange uh, the importance of the work or what we're planning to do. And that's the last slide. Any um, questions, comments, observations? Ms. Bitzer? Um, so thanks again for this presentation. I think it's similar to a lot of social problems in that where you see, you know, I think it's called the hockey stick, you know? The, so the only, the only positive thing I'm gonna say is that like, I think it's something where it's it's not unique, as you said, that we're seeing these trends. And I don't think there are any trends that um, you know are, are surprising us. But I think that what can be unique is the way we respond to them and what our district chooses to do. And so I'm really happy that we've taken the first step of digging into the data, trying to identify um, the individuals who who need this additional help. Because if you look at a lot of other problems, it's kind of this hockey stick. I, I said because. Everybody experiences attend, um, you know, problems with attendance or absence at some point in time, but there are a few folks who need these extra resources. So I think what we need to do is even given this environment of budget constraints, it seems to me like it's totally logical that we do focus in and, and use those resources to support those who are having the hardest time accessing remote learning because it is going to have potentially really long-term issues for these kids in these families. So I, I just want to say, you know, thank you. And and when we're looking forward in the budget, I at least personally, I can't speak for anybody else on this committee, but I think this totally makes sense as an area where we do want to invest and do what we can to try to close these gaps because um, I don't see a end in the short term to remote learning. And so as long as we are in this type of environment, I think it's 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 imperative that we do what we can to to support these kids and these families. So thank you to everybody on your team who's who's working on this and thank you for bringing it to our attention. Mr. Demling. So um, I, I was happy to hear that you, you say that the um, our intensive special needs students may be able to access the virtual learning centers as well. So I, I'm, I'm, I'll be interested to, to, to hear an update on that soon because that's you know while not strict uh, coming from an attendance issue um is obviously um there is um major challenges and obstacles with with that population accessing remote learning as we've as we've uh, noted is is the is the inhibiting factor to expanding virtual learning centers uh is is it is it cost is it space you know, if, if this is successful, if, if, if our very first forays into it are successful and presuming that our next ones are, you know, we have we have many months to go before we hit the end of the school year. Right. So what 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 is going to be the inhibiting factor? And is, is this is this something that we would even consider going back to our, our town or our member towns for additional resources if it, if it was significantly successful? Um, you know, what are your long term thoughts on that? 
Yeah, so space is not a problem. Um, really, it's making sure that the staff, that there's enough high quality staffing for the distance programs, distance learning centers to be able to use, um, and that's their own process. It's, um, and um, and what they feel like they can manage within their current programming capacity, uh, especially in a time where there are fewer students in a room. I mean, if you think of the old style of, of aftercare, um, it just doesn't look like, you know, you can't do it in COVID times. You know, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience for students, but as it was, it was frequently a lot of students in one space or, you know, or multiple spaces that were filled. So it's a really big change for them as well. I just want to note that and for them to scale up um, is going to take time. Um, and, you know, for us, the transportation piece is huge. Um, you know, the, these programs are, you know, charging and some of them have subsidies um, that are helping uh, with that. But I think if you're talking about scaling up at a broader level, then that would involve some financial uh, contribution if we want to make sure that all students, at least there are many students who are struggling, have access to them. So we're, we're sort of, because it's a slow process, because of the state approval of space and their staffing, the need for them to staff up, um, it, it's not going to happen super quick, but I think uh, certainly something I bring back to the committee is there is this need for X resource because um, this is what their capacity has grown to and we have these students and and here's a financial overlay. So right now it's hard to judge, but uh, I think in coming weeks I can come back to the committee. Can I just ask a clarifying question? How many students are are attending these distance learning uh, distance learning centers today? Mm -hmm. and and you talked about sort of you know um, it's it's expanding in the next week or so. What is the, what does that number look like? Um, just for scoping. And then I also had a question, just building on the um, Mr. Demling's comments about cost. Um, and you mentioned subsidies. Just how much of it is how much of these distance learning centers is the district actually? Paying for versus other so you mentioned staff at this we're not paying the staff necessarily so if you could describe a little bit about that just to scope that for us sure so i can't give you an exact number but the numbers are relatively small um so like marks meadow aftercare used to have i think like 100 students on any given day at wildwood last year and it's you know dramatically smaller than that at the moment um and same with lssc who runs the aftercare um at crocker farm um so they're running the programs independently for the intensive special needs that's not quite possible so we are supporting providers to provide um to provide that support for our intensive needs population so that one is being supported by the district um because our outside providers um those two outside providers don't they're not staffed that way um so there is a difference between um kind of the three providers but at the current time really what we're we're giving is in-kind space um and support between Dwayne and marta so uh, but that's something the numbers i can get back to you on later this week i know marta would have it on top of her head but i um sorry i was it's a really important thing in here it just wasn't the whole presentation so i didn't have it uh ready for you tonight my apologies yep um uh, miss dancer i see your hand so. um i i just wanted to say thank you for bringing this to us and i think um it's really good for the public to have this information i i think um for people who and hopefully our community cares about the education of all our students it will help us have more support if they can actually see what's going on. Um, I look forward to updates as you work on this. And I also can't help but think that what you're learning now may help when we go back into the classroom. So while this is not a good thing that's happened to have you really look at this, it may be a long-term thing that's going to benefit students as well. Ms. Kenny, did you have your hand up earlier? No, okay. Any other questions on this? <clears throat> Not seeing any. Um, so th thank you, Dr. Morris. That was that was really in depth um, and, and really helpful information. Thank you. Yeah, so our, our plan will be to come back to you with um, updates on both the data, but also what interventions have proven successful, right? So these future action steps, we want to take them in the near future, but you know, they're not they're not done today, right? The Remind app, I mean, just as a, that's an easy one to talk about. It's, a, you know, Mr. Champion's investigated, but then, you know, if we are able to find CARES Act to fund it, then 
we then have to do it. It has to get set up by our staff. So these things are, they're all um, sort of works in progress, but it's really directly related to what, you know, we heard from students and families and staff and, uh, and others about what the root causes are. And um, we need to do better, do better for our kids. We're going to be, you know, the long lasting consequences of not, um, and I think this was referenced in multiple committee members' comments tonight, uh, are really large. And so um, that's, that's our action plan. And we'll come back and keep on talking about this with you and the public. Okay, so um, hopefully we'll uh, maybe we can uh, make up some time on some of our upcoming agenda items here. <laughs> um, the so next up we have future agenda planning, um, and the old draft was in our packet, but I um, online I added a couple of items. So um, we're not meeting next week. Um, we will enjoy a holiday break. Um, and then uh, have a regional meeting on December 1st, um, TBD, whether we need to have it as a joint meeting with Amherst as well. Um, but we have the vote on the MOA for with the union AFSCME. And I'm guessing that means that they've, that, that union has approved the MOA at this point or voted on it. Or not yet so we'll have to wait for an update to see if that happens before that meeting but that meeting okay. is two weeks away we'll see yeah um in preparation for our four towns meeting um on december 5th um i put with big question marks whether we would be able to see that that um the presentation that we'll be seeing at the four towns meeting on on uh, the december 1st school committee meeting um We'll have the follow-up of the winter sports decision um, and vote. And then I threw on there also, do we want to circle back with a draft resolution um, on the MCAS discussion and seeing head nods? Okay. Do we have any volunteers uh, to draft said resolution? Mr. Denley? Yeah, I mean, I won't get too creative with it. I'll just sort of merge the available content from the Comerford one and the MCAT and the MASC one, and then we'll, you know, pick and choose what we want. That sounds great. Thank you. Are there any other items? I, th I feel like we should um, have as a regular item um, a JLS, um, JLMSC update. Um, Unless we want to just handle it within um, within the school committee announcements, um, I'm seeing thumbs up, so that sounds good. Okay, Mr. Demling, and then Dr. Morris. Yeah, um, based on everything you just said, this is probably too much for one meeting. But um, we had some uh, public comments uh, sent to us recently about the um, the Comandante's uh, sibling policy uh, re related to. Uh, whether we wanted to revisit that or not, um, just wanted to get it on, on our radar for us to yeah. come back to us. We could envision having a separate Amherst School Committee meeting um, with that, as well as, yep, the MSBA update. That is exactly where my head was going. So whether we do that on the 1st or the 8th, we can look at that. Okay. Dr. Morris, did you have another uh, yeah, I was going to say the same thing about MSBA. At that point, you know, we, we likely will have a letter from them in terms of enrollment options. They they um, have determined that we should be able to study, and so it'd be good to have talk be able to talk about that so that the committee's updated. Not you know, not just exclusively the building committee, but the school committee because that has certainly um, the options. You know, going back. What feels like five years ago, but it wasn't uh, when we built a consensus plan and like, for instance, sixth grade to the middle school was being discussed, like we, we will need to re-engage those uh, once we get our um, enrollment letter from the MSBA. Okay. okay. Ms. Dancer. Um, this, this, I'm asking this question as a member of the Pelham School Committee. Is there going to be a meeting of the Pelham School Committee before the four town meeting? Dr. Morris? I would uh, refer you to the chair of the Pelham School Committee who um, probably could um, hazard, hazard an answer on that one. Um, I will do that. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Great. Um, 
So as, as usual, if there's if something um, comes up, feel free to email me um, in the meantime. Um, we have um, warrant report as our next item. Um, and I have three that I have up. Um, so um, Ms. Spitzer, I don't know if you have any, but I can go first. I just have one, but I have to bring it up, so. Okay. Oops, I always click on the wrong thing. Um, okay. Um, I, Alison McDonald, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $125,654.12 for a warrant dated November 6, 2020. This includes general fund expenses of $38,485.34, grant fund expenses of $14,669.44, FEMA fund of $26,642.37, CARES Act Fund of $37,587.43, SPED Program Spending of $115.29, School Reopening of $6,880, Vanguard of $1,274.25. And I signed this on November 16th. I also uh, authorized by my signature um, payable for a warrant dated November 18th um, for payroll in the amount of $673,973.95. And I signed that on November 13th. And I have one more. I authorized a uh, payroll in the amount of $3,965.01, dated November 4th, and I signed that on November 13th. And that is all that I have for Amherst. Ms. Spitzer? Yep. Um, so I, uh, Carrie Spitzer, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $30,729.60 for the warrant dated November 16th, 2020, this included general fund expenses of $30,729.60, and, and I signed this on, our, sorry, November 17th, 2020, and that's it. Okay. Um, and I don't believe we have any gifts um, in for tonight to review, so we'll move on to um, Item number 11, which is to adjourn the Amherst School Committee. So I will move to adjourn the Amherst School Committee. Is there a second? Second. I think I heard Mr. Harrington first, so he, he wins the, the gold star. Um, so <laughs> uh, moved by McDonald, seconded by Harrington. There's no discussion, so we'll move to a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. I didn't realize we got gold stars. What is this? <laughs> Um, Mr. Harrington. Thank you, hi. Um, Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The Amherst School Committee is adjourned. Um, and seeing that we have um, our, our guests, would folks be amenable to making a quick agenda swap um, and start with item number 13? Okay, great. So uh, welcome, uh, Ms. Stewart. Um, so we'll we'll move to um, we'll we'll skip item twelve for now and come back to it after the fall sports review and winter sports discussion. So I'll just cue this up um, that um, Athletic Director Stewart's going to present uh, with a review of fall. That'll be brief, and then uh, a longer uh, presentation about winter preview. Um, and so um, we, we're not asking for a vote tonight, to be really clear, there, there's one wrinkle. We won't ask for a vote, but there is one wrinkle in terms of timing that Ms. Stewart will talk about um, as we go through it. But I just want to appreciate all the work of coaches, of Ms. Stewart, of the trainer, Ross, of everyone who made the fall sports season uh, really meaningful. Uh, as you'll find out, there was a number of, unfortunately, cancellations when we hit the red and the old map and, and schools wouldn't play us and all those kind of things. 
And yet, uh, you know, I know you've received a number of emails, probably just to your school committee uh, email account, but also the public comment, but just how meaningful it was for students to be able to build that relationship, to be active, to be physical, um, given that they weren't in school. Uh, was really helpful um, for their mental health. So I just want to appreciate all the folks who made that happen. Ms. Stewart, would you like me to present the slides so that you can still see everybody? Because I have two screens, so I can do that pretty easily. Would that be helpful for you? Um, I can actually do it because I just wanted to show them a couple comments. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Thanks guys for having me again. I'm coming in a little bit later than normal. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for your flexibility. Oh yeah, totally fine. All right, so thanks again for you know voting yes to fall sports. Um, like Dr. Moore spoke about, it was great. Um, it was actually fun. I know it was different, um, but a lot of the student athletes, the coaches, um, and all the other supporting staff really bought into everything and adapted really well. So as far as fall sports go, we had 10 teams total practicing and nine out of 10 of those teams were able to play in competitions. And then we had a total of 71 games played all together. And um, the number of rescheduled games, I should change it because today we had another one. Boys soccer actually got canceled because of Palmer's Fields. So now it's at, actually at 47 because girls also got postponed yesterday um, for different reasons. So uh, Dr. Morris spoke about how when we went red, um, schools wouldn't play us and that's where a lot of the there was like a two week time frame where we had to reschedule a lot of games so that was interesting but like I said before the student athletes really did a good job adapting to everything and I really appreciate all the parents and guardians also being really flexible and right here I just said the student athletes had fun I'll share it real quick so I had them student athletes fill out a padlet of why it was important having fall sports this um this year, especially because due to the pandemic. And I just want to read, I'll just read a couple randomly. Um, I really enjoyed doing a fall sport and I'm glad that we can still do them in spite of COVID-19. It's important to me because it is a way that I can be active and go to meets. And I also get to see people in person and not just on a screen. It helps me stay positive because it gives me something to look forward to every day. Um, and then another student athlete wrote, the season was incredible because I got to see some of my favorite people and have fun outside. Field hockey has helped me by getting me to do something out of the house. It has given me a day of structure and allowed me to focus better. My teammates and coach are amazing and I look forward to practice every day. So I just appreciate, you guys can take time. You guys have the link right there and read some of the comments that the student athletes had, um, but it was, it was great. That picture right there of Mayori right over here on the right, our volleyball player, that was in the Boston Globe. I don't know if any of you guys got that, but it was on the front section of the sports cover. So that was awesome too. We had a lot of media there because we were outdoors. As far as the timeline goes um, for winter sports, we're looking at modifications from the MI coming out uh, by Friday or earlier next week. Um, hopefully we'll have a better idea of what modifications are gonna be for each sport. The PVIC board of directors have already put out an announcement though. And one big one being that the start date for winter sports has been pushed to January 4th. So we would have to wait for the exception of girls ice hockey, which is new. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but they are, we're planning on doing that on November 30th. However, we do need a vote. So our student athletes who are registered, we have two, it's a co-op um, that are registered right now from Amherst Regional High School. They will have to wait until they are approved. So more about the PVIC Board of Directors announcement. They talked about the bubble competition be continuing. Um, so this fall, the bubble competition, we just played against certain schools and stayed within our bubble. We didn't go outside our bubble. Each sport had different bubbles, except for cross country and soccer. They were in the same bubble. And then field hockey and volleyball were in different bubbles. Again, start date would start later. It will end, unfortunately, at the same time. So it is a short season, which means that all the team sports, basketball, swimming, ice hockey, will have 10 to 12 games in Skiing will have five to six contests. Uh, unfortunately, that was probably one of my biggest, um, not complaints, but you know, just they wanted more games and they wanted more competitions. But unfortunately, with the limited amount of time, we are limited with the number of games that we are allowed. Uh, spectators, they're telling us that we can follow state guideline recommendations similar to fall. And then out of season coaching, um, there'll be no out of season coaching during this winter season. 
and I don't know if you guys were aware, but we didn't have spectators um, this fall. Uh, the only day we did have spectators and they all got lanyards were senior days and each student was allowed the amount that the state recommends. Uh, activities allowed by risk level. So you guys will see this slide deck is similar to what you guys saw on my first presentation this fall. So these are just the activities that allow, are allowed based on the risk levels of each sport. Level one being the least amount of activity that students are allowed to do with one another, which includes non-contact work, workouts, individual skill and drills, all the way up to tournaments um, for outdoor sports only. As far as limitation guideline goes, the risk levels for sports hasn't changed. So when you saw that there was a sport that was high risk in the beginning of the fall, they're still high risk now. However, they can still be played with modifications. So low risk can play and participate in one, two, three, and four, and high risk and moderate risk can participate in one, two, and three with modifications. So typically every winter season, we have basketball, hockey, indoor track, alpine, Nordic, swim and dive. Um, this year, indoor track is going to, is not going to happen. I, I will touch upon that a little bit later, but unfortunately the space availability is not there. And just looking forward to the future, we are still looking at football being in the floating season and any sports possibly that we won't have in the winter. We just have to keep in mind um, other schools that possibly won't have winter sports as well, just so we know that we could have some competition. And then obviously we have spring season that will happen right after the floating season. So as I said before, you'll see some blanks, uh, MIA modifications to be determined, which I hope I can get them to you guys by Friday um, at the latest, um, if not next week. And um, yeah, alpine skiing is low risk. So that means they can participate in levels one through four. Our alpine ski team currently, um, they currently have all their competition at Berkshire East and all their sport guidelines are right here on this link, so you can click on it if you have any questions or wanna review them. We also have a lot of their training in the weight room as well. And fortunately, the weight room has come back um, with the recommended numbers um, and more. So that's great for the ACH, um, the air chambers per hour. Um, and so we will be looking at putting them there as well as they usually are to train. Basketball, um, basketball is a little bit of a different story. Um, as of now, we know that our courts have not met the recommended for ACH um, air chambers per hour. However, uh, we're looking at modifications. When I say we, I've been working really closely with our director of facilities, Rupert, and we're looking at modifications and repairs under performing, under all these underperforming spaces and have some outside contractors coming in to do some improvements and modifications to these areas. So um, I don't know, Rupert's really helping me out a lot. I'm learning a lot of new things um, and it's great. <laughs> and uh, basketball, yeah, like I said, high school and middle school. So we're looking at recommend, uh, fixing those spaces. Victoria, if I could just uh, jump in. So you may yes. remember last year at the very end, which you may or may not remember because it was so, so nutty that there was um, some funds set aside for capital for COVID related expenses. And I'm not talking about CARES Act funds. Um, just capital funds. And so as we are looking at the gym, uh, not just for athletics, but just hopefully actually for you know future use um, uh, because it is low and we couldn't run a gym class right now. Um, if, you know, if we wanted to, uh, he's got, Rupert has two potential fixes or solutions to the challenges as Ms. Stewart described. And so, uh, but I just wanna be clear, they are financial obligations, but they were already funded through the capital requests that were approved last spring. So this would not be new funding requests and, it, and you know what he mentioned to me, I know he's been working much more closely with Ms. Stewart on this, but just that it would fall below what was appropriated and, and what Dr. Dr. Slaughter has in terms of from capital expenses that we could utilize to improve the air changes per hour in the gym. Um, again, that's it'd be great for basketball, but it'd also just be great for the gym to be able to be used because um, we don't imagine um, this illness or you know the virus going away that soon and so it would have multiple benefits not just for athletics but certainly uh, more acutely for athletics at the current time sorry to jump in miss stewart no worries um and so for boys ice hockey we have a similar issue um but we kind of solved it uh unfortunately amherst college is not renting to us um this winter um due to covid so we found a rink at collins arena which is in greenfield um they're willing to rent 
financially, it's fine. It's looking good compared to what we also get with Amherst College. Amherst College is very um, lenient and very nice when they're giving us their rink time. But because this is a shorter amount of time, this will do just fine um, financially as well. And our these ranks have guidelines as well that they're following. And um, I know you guys probably already know that sports are already going on outside all these sports that are being played. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind as well. Girls ice hockey. So this is fun and exciting and new. Um, we have a co-op with Pope Francis, which includes eight different schools. Um, Amherst, Pope, Northampton, Frontier, Hopkins, Chicopee, Taconic, and Pittsfield. Um, so as of right now, Pope is the one that's in charge of this. They have the most girls. So they are the ones that took the lead on this co-op. The start date would have to start on November 30th, um, as long as MI doesn't push it back on Friday, just because there's a limited amount of teams in this, uh, in this area. So like I said before, the January 4th start date was determined by the PVIC. So that's our league that's here locally. So unfortunately that means our girls hockey team would have to travel a lot more in order to have competition. The only other school that's nearby in Massachusetts is Long Meadow, which is, they also have a co-op with a lot of other schools as well. Um, so they would be looking at going to Eastern Mass. And I put their tentative game schedule right there. And they also have a lot more uh, facilities that they go practice in. They will practice in Sear, uh, Olympia, Fitzpatrick, and they would also practice at MassCon Training in Aguam. So those are four facilities that they would use for hockey. Victoria, um, because this isn't the only sport, although maybe it's the most acute issue, can you describe what a co-op is uh, and how many of our sports have some level of co-op status? Yeah, so usually, so it's a school, so a co-op is just when someone else joins another program because we do not have enough to fill a program. So we had a co-op last year with Granby. We didn't have enough kids that wanted to go play there. So then now that co-op is over. However, we do host a lot of co-ops as well. So I think in the public comments, you may have seen some Hopkins parents, I think wrote in um, from what I read and they are in, a, in our co-op because we didn't have enough to hold a whole swim team. And the Hopkins kid, kids really brought in um, a good amount of kids and it helped our program and it builds with numbers and hopefully more of our own student athletes will see how fun it is to be, join the swim team and join that. Uh, we also have one with our boys ice hockey team. Uh, we host it and we have Palmer and Hopkins joining with us for our boys hockey team too. So that is um, what a co-op is. So it's just an opportunity for our girls to be able to play um, girls ice hockey instead of just being on the boys team. And I forgot to say, I think before, but ice hockey is the same as basketball. So that's levels one through three. So basically basketball and ice hockey, even though they're seen as high risk sports, um, they can participate in games with modifications, which aren't out yet. So indoor track, which is seen as a moderate risk sport, unfortunately, there's no season this winter. Um, the rental space is not available. Typically, we, we, as in the PVIC, rents out Smith College. Um, everyone pays in uh, to the PVIC, and they run the whole um, indoor track meets. Uh, and unfortunately, Smith is also not renting out to anyone. So therefore, indoor track has been canceled for the season. Nordic skiing is also seen as a low risk sport. They participate in competition at Notchview. Other than that, they will be practicing at our high school. They also use the weight room um, and their levels one through four. So they can have tournaments as well. So that's just something to keep in mind. And swimming. So swimming, uh, that's an area that still needs to be tested at the middle school. So I know that's on Rupert's to-do list before Thanksgiving, I believe, as one of the areas to test. So I don't know um, anything about that area in particular. However, we're hoping um, that comes out well too. So they can also participate in levels one through three with modifications. If I could add to that one, Ms. Stewart, um, just the other uh, thing to note is right now, and the, the pool was drained last year and, and never refilled. So there's some additional challenges with the pool. Um, you know, I, I talked to the town, I talked to actually the town manager this afternoon about that. Um, an additional challenge that I'm hearing from others uh, as it relates to swimming, and I'm not trying to play my cards um, about what I would recommend and, and what I think you all should do, but it, it, it's a challenging sport in terms of use of locker rooms. Uh, some of the other sports are a little easier to imagine not using locker rooms. And so the modifications for swimming that I've heard about from other superintendents don't just involve actually in the pool area, it involves 
uh, entry and access uh, to the pool and, and how that goes when it might be like zero degrees out and you've been in a cold pool swimming. So I think the modifications, I'm looking forward to seeing them because um, I know that it's not as much the actual swimming that uh, many superintendents are concerned about. It, it's much more everything other than the actual act of swimming. Um, and I know other places have worked it out. I'm not saying it can't work, but I just want to note that the two variables here are one, the pool has no water uh, and we'll get the air testing results back and, and take some next steps but also kind of the nature of swimming and the nature of locker rooms um, in terms of community spread uh, based on what we've seen, not particular swimming, but locker rooms and gyms have um, kind of those kind of spaces have, have not been the, they've been problematic spaces. So uh, those are some of the modifications. I just wanted to make sure I brought in the modifications, not just the competition, it's actually the, the whole kit and caboodle of um, from walking the building to leaving the building, what would that look like? And that that's the that's everything. So I can take any questions that you guys may have. Mr. Demling. Yeah, I mean, I just want to say briefly, thanks for, put, for putting this together. Um, I think the the structure, following the same structure as last time, is is, is really helpful for us. Um, I'm sure once those guidelines drop, uh, it'll be very, it'll be a very engaging uh, time of active discussion. And you know, just from my point of view. You know, when we make this decision, you know, I, I rely heavily as input on on what your your take is and and what Dr. Morris's take is and and how your coaches are feeling, um, and and obviously the 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 guidelines that we get from the state in terms of like what has to happen to be safe is is one take, right? It's it's what they think is safe, and then we sort of have to reality check that against how that implements in in our environment, in our facilities, and and with our way of doing things. Um, so uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm, when we vote next time, I look forward to hearing that, that feedback, you know, from, from you and from, from Dr. Morris and from your coaches and, um, and, you know, putting that all together, you know, obviously from the input from the students and the families, you know, we, we wanna, we understand what a challenging year this is. And we want everybody to have like a great time, right? And, and, and a fulfilling experience, um, but you know, wanna do it safely at the same time. So look forward to that, thank you. I, I would, maybe this is just a clarifying question, but when we're approving and voting on this, we're, we're not actually getting involved in sort of what are the requirements for gameplay or, or practice. That's not what we're talking about. So the, the modifications to the sport that the MIAA is, is, is input for us to consider, but we're not going to be discussing the, the merits of, of those those modifications beyond sort of facilities and and coaching and all the other the other things around that we can discuss because I don't think that's really within our scope. Yeah, I think the only caveat I'd have is the modifications may I don't want to I'm just going to say it. so you may collectively or individually say based on the modifications I'm not comfortable with that sport happening. Yeah. Right. So that's the only caveat I want to say. Like I, I don't want to suggest that. Uh, if any individual committee member feels like the modifications aren't sufficient for you to feel comfortable moving forward, you certainly should have that in your calculus and your decision making. Um, and I think maybe that's the conversation we could have next time when we have that is, is much like the spectator piece in the fall, right? That was, we got really clear feedback that the committee didn't want to have spectators at games with certain exceptions and, and you know, that Victoria talked about. And so, you know, I, I just wanted to, 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 to kind of hold that. And I think the other thing that is really critical and we'll think about timing, especially given the later start, except for girls hockey, is to a certain extent, it's dependent on what everybody else does too, right? Um, so if we're the only school that has, says yes to any sport, the sport probably is, maybe they could practice, but they're not playing any games against anyone, right? So that's not an option. And that's sort of, so, you know, my recommendation, you know, on a broader scale is um, we don't always need to be the first out of the gate. Um, especially because we, with the exception of girls hockey, um, however you think about it, that, that one, it will be potentially earlier, but everybody else, you know, we have time, we have till early January and not to feel like, um, if you all need more time to discuss it or consider it, or we need to get, you know, hear what other communities are doing. I think you, the nice thing about the later start is you have a little bit more time and I'm not trying to, I know many families are anxious for this information. I'm not at all trying to delay them knowing what we're doing, but I also don't want the committee to feel unduly rushed to make a decision that may be undone by what other committees do too. Ms. Seeger. 
Uh, thank you, Ms. Stewart, for the information. Um, generally, I, I'm in support of the kids playing sports. I think it's it's a good thing for so many reasons right now. Um, in the fall, when we talked about volleyball, um, remind me, I don't know if I'm remembering this correctly, but it was all outside um, the whole season. We didn't want them playing in the gym. And so I think the thing that's like generally I'm in support of all this. My concern is with something like basketball where we wouldn't have volleyball in the gym. So would we, you know, now turn around and have basketball in the gym and think that's okay, especially with cases on the rise in our area. So I'm just wondering if, if you have thoughts on that or maybe it's just waiting for the guidelines to come out. I don't know, but that's a concern I've had in, in um, thinking about all of this. Yeah, I'll start if that's okay, Victoria, and then you can jump in. So I think one of the other challenges we had in the fall is we didn't have the air quality testing done on the gyms yet. So that's a really critical variable. I'm not suggesting that, that you know any committee member should vote one way or the other. I think the indoor piece is certainly something to consider, but we weren't in a place where we could certify that the gym was ready to be used. Um, and what we found out more recently is it's not ready to be used and we're working on solutions. So that wasn't in, in place in the fall. So uh, you know, in terms of the volleyball piece and, and practicing and playing at home, they were outside on site, but part of that was, um, in my opinion, was that we didn't have the data we needed to, to share with you so that you could make a more informed judgment. Ms. Pitzer? Yeah, and, oh, oh, sorry, Ms. Stewart? No, and just in addition to that, our volleyball teams were traveling to other gyms as well. So they were indoors playing at away teams, right? But they weren't playing inside at home. So we just have to keep that in mind. Um, obviously, it'd be tougher to play basketball and practice outdoors in the winter and then travel and go indoors. Um, but we just have to keep that in mind. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. I'm, I, you know, I really feel good about our decision to allow sports in the fall. And I'm going to be quite open right now that I'm feeling very, very nervous about the idea of having sports um, in our current environment with cases rising so much. Um, and particularly the indoor sports. So I, I guess one of my questions is, you know, with football, we we postponed that. And so is there any reason, I was looking at the list of sports that would be in the spring. And again, this is gonna, I'm really glad that we are don't have to make this vote today because I think, you know, as with everything in the pandemic, things are changing rapidly. But um, what is the situation, you know, first off, it will give us time to, fix whatever needs to be fixed in the gym to increase airflow. But um, it would also give us time to see if we can get our cases under control. Because there, there are two things that I'm concerned about. One is that it's not just our community. So Hampshire County could be doing well, but it's a lot of the teams you're talking about are outside of our county in Hamden County, which is doing particularly poorly within our state right now. And, and that makes me nervous. Um, the other thing that's making me nervous, even with the outdoor sports, is, you know, I was I was a varsity ski team member. I loved it. I, I want to make that opportunity available for other kids in our community. But we drove on a bus that was very crowded for a good 30 to 45 minutes up to Berkshire East. So even though once you're outdoor in the ski environment, I think it's fairly safe. I, it seems to me like the, the inequalities we'd be reinforcing by allowing only the outdoor sports and then potentially requiring folks to like how how do you social distance on these charter buses? I, I don't know if it's still taking a charter bus but when I was a kid you know we'd charter a bus that would go up maybe it's just the the five-star buses now but anyway I, I I could see like oh everybody gets their own ride but again that's creating all of this other inequality so so those are my concerns so I guess one thing I, I'd ask is are we going to you know I know people were canceling with us last year um season because we were in quote unquote the red or is that something that we would potentially be doing um especially with the sports where we have longer um and then then what what are the ideas of mitigating i know we have rules about um the actual play of the sports are there rules about getting to say the ski sport where the kids are gonna race and um assuming like are there any thoughts of kind of a a plan to get kids outside and exercising in the event that we would vote um, not to allow indoor sports. Because I, I think the exercise component, the camaraderie that's building is really important, but it just is feeling really unsafe to do these types of things indoors right now. So sorry, that was a lot of questions. Um, thanks. I think, you know, one thing maybe you could talk about, Ms. Stewart, is the bus and how the bus situation, you know, worked in the fall and how might it work in the winter. 
Yeah, so I'm assuming that we'll we just keep following the DESE guidelines that we've been following for the bus rides. Um, it's pretty clear on the buses, you know, our bus drivers and um, facility department did a great job marking where our students um, should be sitting. Um, ben, do you have more to speak on that or do you just have a, okay. Um, I just didn't know because that's, I know you're in that department. Um, so I would just say we'll, we'll continue to follow those guidelines with the travel, which is 23 kids on the bus. Um, well, and including the coach, uh, whether we need to get more buses and parents and guardians who felt uncomfortable, they did drive their, they were allowed to drive their student athletes um, to these events if they chose to do so. So that's always an option. The windows are, op are kept open at all times. It's gonna be a little chilly, um, but they're on the slopes anyway. So I think they hopefully will have the right equipment um, to stay warm on the bus. Mr. Harrington. Yeah, so I didn't have anything to say about transportation dealing with that, but I'll use that as a segue into my, my next question. With um, with, with the sports like like hockey, the girls will be traveling to Springfield, I imagine, to, to practice, and then and then the boys team would travel up to, to Greenfield. I assume we would use our transportation to do that, like whether it's five star or in house. Is is that sort of the plan or? Typically, they would just get their own transportation to practices. We don't give um, transportation to practices. So um, I've already spoke with the hockey coaches as well for the boys' side. As far as the girls go, um, there's two student athletes that are registered right now with, to play with Pope, um, and they would normally just get their own transportation to practice. So um... I have a quick question and then um, some thoughts. Um, would there, so several of these sports also have JV, which to some extent um, leads into the middle school too. Would that, would those be going forward as well or is that TBD? For certain sports, um, such as boys ice hockey, I imagine they're not being a JV team this year, unfortunately. Um, normally we'd have to use a waiver anyways um, to make a JV team. So we would definitely have, you know, a tryout like normal, and then the varsity team will be chosen just because we have limited ice time. Um, again, Amherst College normally gives us a lot of ice time, and this year we just are limited with that space and area. Um, as far as I'm trying to think of other teams, basketball and girls basketball, they normally have JV programs as well. Um, I mean, there's less kids that showed up for the fall anyways, as is, so I can see JV teams being a little bit smaller, maybe only having one boys JV team, and if there is a girls for basketball, having that as well. Interesting, okay. So I, I just had a couple of observations. Um, I think one of the, the biggest one um, that would be helpful probably for, for us as we consider this is that for most or many of these sports, um, a lot of these kids are already playing these sports um, on club teams and they're playing on teams with kids from multiple towns. So they're not exclusive. They're not playing exclusively within Amherst. They're not playing exclusively within Hampshire County, um, both in terms of who's on their team and where they're practicing. So, you know, um, as many of you know, but I will just full disclosure, I have a hockey player and I have a swimmer. Um, so <laughs> the hockey player is, you know, they're practicing at rinks. Um, all of the rinks that um, Ms. Stewart named, um, they're practicing and attending games there and playing teams that are coming from Eastern Mass um, all the time, as well as across the, the entire Pioneer Valley. So that's happening right now. And so many of these kids that are playing on these teams would also, so when we think about co-op sports, those, the, the kids that are playing um, co-op co are also playing with our Amherst kids on these hockey teams as well. So um, they're already sort of exposed with each other. Um, the other thing too is, is some of the folks said in public comment, these kids, um, because they're playing right now and they're, they're already sort of traveling and exposing themselves to um, other athletes from um, around our area, they're also very, very used to the protocols. Um, both from, you know, whether it's the ice, um, ice hockey, getting dressed literally in the parking lot, and no joke, um, they are you know, stripping down and it, was, uh, it wasn't warm this weekend, <laughs> and, and getting dressed and just walking in and putting on their skates at the rink, um, and the swimmers wearing their swimsuits to and from practice, and 
just bundling in layers um, after practice and just walking straight to their cars to, to leave. Um, swimmers are not have there's no meets right now, um, or very few meets. There's they're doing virtual meets um, as opposed to dual meets. So you're still within your own bubble when you're swimming races. Um, but there are there are some that are happening. So I think you know that's a really important consideration for us when we think about um, safety. Is it's already happening? And frankly, most of those clubs will continue whether or not um, whether or not there's high school sports. Um, and as some parents have commented, they feel that actually the work that um, Ms. Stewart and her coaching team and, and the others in, in sort of our league have been doing have been, they feel safer in that environment than they do in some clubs. Um, so I just put that out there as, as sort of something to keep in mind as we think about it. Um, and, and also sort of thinking about the case counts, um, the when there's a, when, you know, I would I would expect that if there's if case counts go up um, and we're in the red that then um, those those games wouldn't happen whether it's us um, in the red or the other town um, that we might be playing is in the red and that would be no different than what was in the fall and then the last thing too is um, just sort of thinking about whether or not other towns or other schools in our league would be playing. Um, I think one of the things we heard and, and that Padlet, I, I look forward to going and reading more of those comments, is that for many of the athletes, it's just the practice. Just having the practice and seeing their teammates is, is reward enough. Um, and sure, they would love to, to play the games and have the competition, but even if there isn't competition, I think they're getting so much value out of just practicing with each other that I would keep that in mind because I don't know what you know, whether we delay um, that that shoulder season, it, again, it, it's going to be dependent on whether other other teams go um, to the shoulder season as well. So those are just a sort of thoughts that I'm toying around with my head. And I think, you know, the key thing is, you know, from from our, our you know, coaching staff, you know, do we have coaches that are comfortable um, with the protocols and comfortable from, from their own perspective? Do we have the facilities and ability to to manage that and sort of present that is, is sort of where my, my questions are heading. So sorry for speaking a long time, but Ms. Ms. Stancer and then Mr. Harrington. Um, I'm going to second a lot of what uh, Ms. McDonald just said. I have two grandsons who've playing, been playing hockey since the fall um, and doing all the things that, that she talked about. I would just add, um, when the the rinks were closed for two weeks so that everything could be cleaned and then the new the, the modifications for hockey now require as as Ms. McDonald mentioned the players have to come in dressed that was not the case all this time that they've been playing and I also understand from one of my grandsons that referees have been giving penalties and um, disqualifications if, if any player or coach or team does not follow the guidelines. So they're very serious um, about making sure that the players are doing what they're supposed to be doing. But the guidelines are going to be much more strict than they were this fall. So um, i just like to add that in. Mr. Harrington? Yeah, shout out to all my colleagues for setting me up for the uh, with the segues here. This is awesome. So I, I have so, somewhat of an anecdote, and then a question related to the anecdote. So, so what what I've noticed from my office is in the middle school. So we we've seen the, the middle school cross country team a lot. And there's there's something that I've noticed in terms of like mass compliance and these sorts of things. And that my in my observation, they have been probably the best behaved folks on our school property in, in terms of mask usage. So I was just kind of wondering like, how did that look during the season for, for our athletes? How, how, how difficult was it for, um, you know, kind, kind of enforcement? I remember you said something about having, potentially having monitors or, or someone there to, to assist with that. And um, I'm, I'm generally biased towards student athletes. I, I feel like there's like a different level of discipline and I was just, Wondering if that was like reflected in the fall and, and if that would kind of give us an idea of what the, the winter would look like. 
Yeah, I mean, they did a phenomenal job. Um, yes, here and there, I would have to tell someone to pull up their mask, like your nose is out, like pull up your mask. Um, but to be honest with you, that wasn't a huge issue throughout the whole season. Um, we definitely had like Ross going around our trainer, reminding student athletes, um, some just needed a new mask, uh, you know, playing sports in masks, it's kind of a little dirty, whatever. Um, so they would just get a new mask and we had plenty. It was great. I think all the kids did a great job, coaches as well. They would be, they're there to enforce rules as well. Um, and they did that. Not many complaints. The kids just want to play. So they will do whatever it takes to play. If you tell them they need to, you know, play defense in a mask, skate in a mask. Um, unfortunately you can't really swim in a mask. I mean, I guess you could, but that'd be tough. Um, they would do it though, you know, and it's just great to see. The swimmers have their mask on right until the point that they get into the water. <laughs> yeah, just imagine them diving into the water though with their masks on if they had something. Oh my gosh. Miss Kenny. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for the fall season. I had a volleyball player who loved it and and like like you said before they they just want to play you wear a mask she now won't leave the house without one like she wears it all the time you know like i think um i think i think the kids need it for their physical health but especially their mental health and the not just like seeing other people but having that camaraderie with their teammates has been huge like the difference in the days between when they were practicing versus the days they were not practicing it was you know a huge difference so i i really appreciate uh the falls the fall season and i'm looking forward to future seasons oh my and my other question was um you know most of these sports have been talked about at the high school level will there be options for the middle schoolers as well so this winter we are looking at, so numbers, the only reason why middle schoolers participated in certain sports in the winter were due to um, low numbers. So that would include this winter in particular, um, swimming. Um, and there's one other, oh, girls basketball. If we were looking at fielding a JV team, um, that's just another story, um, just because we don't have enough girls to field the JV team. Other than that, the waivers for like Nordic, we already, meet that baseline number so we technically wouldn't uh, uh, pr be approved for that waiver in using it so it wasn't really ever a middle school sport so people get confused a little bit about that yeah so it wasn't a middle school sport it's just a it's just a waiver so then we can actually have enough to fill the team yes sorry i just i'm not sure i'm understanding so yes there already is a waiver so yes middle schoolers can be on the nordic team or no, there's enough high schoolers that want to be Nordic skiers, so no middle schoolers can participate. I just the want to make sure. one. The yeah, no. One. Yeah. Oh, okay. I know. <laughs> Any other questions? Not seeing any. Okay. So um, I'm. Uh, I heard that we do have to move to a vote for girls hockey. Is that correct? Yep. Yes. The other option if the committee uh, doesn't feel comfortable yet voting is, you know, you could schedule a meeting before between now and November 30th. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you need to, but I just reading facial expressions. Um, it's another option, not that anyone wants another meeting, perhaps, but um, if people feel like they need more time, it's the 17th now. I know there's a holiday uh, that many people celebrate next week, but not everyone, but it's, it is a state and federal holiday, so you couldn't meet on that day, but they're, they're, if, if there were more time, if people felt like they needed more time to consider, it is an option. Again, I'm not pushing that option, just suggesting that it exists. Mr. Demley? Uh, I move to approve girls hockey for the winter 2020 season. Second. Um, moved by Demling, seconded by Kenny. And we'll move to a roll call vote, unless there's further discussion. No. 
Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Uh, Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Aye. Ms. Lord. Lord abstain. Ms. Seeger. Seeger abstain. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer abstain. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. So the mash motion passes six, um, six to zero with three abstentions. Uh, okay, so the others will move, uh, will come back again after, um, after the Thanksgiving break. Thank you very much, Ms. Stewart. Thank you guys. Have a good night. So now we'll uh, circle back to item number 12, um, our high school graduation requirements for the class. It, I believe it's the class of 2021 and beyond. Um, correct, yep. yep. So we discussed this, oh, sorry. No, no, please. Um, we discussed uh, these uh, at our meeting last week. The memo is in our packet again. Oh, and thank you. Dr. Morris is going to display it for us to remind us. Uh, I don't know if there's, um, did you want to add anything, Dr. Morris? Um, nope, uh, there was, you know, uh, based on the discussion last time, there were no recommended changes. So um, this is exactly what you looked at um, last week. But uh, we would ask for a vote tonight because depending on the vote will trigger other changes that need to occur at the high school. Okay. And is there any discussion? Um, seeing none, then um, I will move that we approve the proposed revised graduation requirements for Amherst High School beginning in with the class of 2021. Second. Moved by McDonald and seconded by Stancer. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll move to a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Mr. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously nine to zero. Excellent. Um, uh, so Mr. Demling, seeing uh, that you are, you just raised your hand, I'm going to ask if you want to make a motion. <laughs> I, was, I was actually yawning, but perhaps it's related uh, to the motion. Yeah, that's why I'm um, calling you out. <laughs> I, I move to adjourn the Regional School Committee. Second. Moved by Demling, seconded by Harrington. And there's no discussion. We'll move to a uh, roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling abstain. <laughs> Mr. Harrington. Harrington, I. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, I. Ms. Lord. Lord, I. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, I. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, I. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, I. And Peter, I'm sorry you didn't sing your abstention. <laughs> Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, I. Then McDonald, I. The motion passes eight to zero with one abstention. We are adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Good night, Margaret. <laughs>